This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It is four minutes after ten. We are going to dive shortly into uh, matters Scottish, uh, particularly with reference to events uh, in Parliament on Wednesday and to a lesser extent yesterday. But I I just want to begin with a a warning, Um, something that, do you know, the the, the clips that started going a little bit crazy a few years ago are are, are a... they can be a poison chalice. I, I mean, first of all, they can get taken out of context. So the th- a three-hour show distilled down into a 90-second clip that, of course, people who haven't listened to the three-hour show can use uh, to jump to very, very curious conclusions. But on the plus side, they do provide a record of, of, of what you've done. Do you know, it was in 2017 that I started calling out colleagues even, um, certainly other presenters and producers for giving platforms to is- Islamist extremists because they were they were good box office. I think the point at which I realized we'd gone somewhere very, very silly was when I found myself in the green room for the Alan Titchmarsh show on ITV, a sort of very uh, gentle afternoon entertainment presented by a brilliant broadcaster and a lovely, lovely man. And Anjem Chowdhury, do you remember him? Walk, walked into the green room in, in his in his full robes with an entourage, he, like a sort of uh, like, like a sort of uh, a Kardashian of extremism. And I just thought, why are we giving these people oxygen? Because they do something terrible. They create the illusion that extremists are representative of communities. Uh, and I warned in 2017, if you're interested, I'll, I'll, I'll share the clip. I didn't bother earlier because I thought it was a bit self-referential. Um, but I, I warned in 2017 that if you start doing that, then some very dangerous, unpleasant and or stupid people will take up the invitation with alacrity. And today, Suella Braverman in the pages of the Daily Telegraph comes closer than any prominent politician has ever come to conflating all Muslims with Islamist extremists. I, you've probably noticed already how they have sucked, or how they've tried to conflate being against the killing in Gaza, calling for an end to the killing, calling for an end to the carnage, is somehow pro-Hamas. If, if, for example, you march, I know people who've marched. I know Christian pensioners who have marched in support of Palestine. I know people who were outside Parliament on, on Wednesday who have never been near a mosque or a church or a synagogue in their lives. I know Jews who are passionately opposed to what the Israeli government is doing in Israel. But people like Braverman and their, um, their helpers, if you like, in the right-wing media are trying to successfully conflate uh, a pro Hamas with anti carnage. It's it's extraordinary and it's very ugly and it's quite scary. And I mention it because I was right in 2017 about the direction of traffic defined by the promotion of dangerous clowns like Anjem Chowdhury. And I think I'm right about this. I, I, I look at what Braverman writes in the Daily Telegraph about Muslims on the day that the Times reports anti Muslim hate has tripled since October the 7th. Um, That doesn't get the same coverage as spikes in anti-Semitic hate, and it just should. It's the weirdest thing I said to you on October October the 8th, it would have been. I said to you, the thing that people, some people seem hardest, seem to find hardest to grasp is that I find anti-Semitism as abhorrent as Islamophobia. I find the killing of an Israeli child by Hamas as heartbreaking as the killing of a Palestinian child by the Israeli Defense Force. I appreciate all the philosophical nuances and all the semantic arguments, but I, I, I just do, and I, and, I, and I never won't. And however hard people try to insist that there are differences, I, I, I will never bow to that pressure. So that is just a heads up I want to give you. The conflation of extremist with... Muslim is very deliberate and very, very dangerous. And it is, uh, I, I mean, clear that the kind of rhetoric deployed by Suella Braverman, a dismissed, a twice dismissed and, uh, and thrice disgraced former Home Secretary, it's clearly that kind of rhetoric that leads to this kind of headline. Anti-Muslim haters tripled since attacks by Hamas. 
attempts to portray everybody marching for peace in Palestine as being pro-Hamas is, is, is as disgusting as it is dangerous. Um, but there it is. And if you want an example of what happens when these ludicrous, disgraced politicians are left to rail freely in the in the atmosphere, have a look at what Liz Truss is doing in America at the moment, sharing a platform not only with Steve Bannon, claiming that it was the media that somehow and trans activists that somehow caused the failure of her policies. If she's not claiming that she wasn't allowed to introduce the policies that she actually introduced, she's claiming that they got scuppered by trans activists and the UK media. I don't need to remind you of the Daily Mail and Daily Telegraph front pages that are treated her like the second coming. Admittedly, perhaps the second coming of Margaret Thatcher rather than the second coming of Jesus Christ, but still the messianic status afforded to her for a few of the 49 days that she managed to cling onto power before being knocked out by a lettuce were extraordinary. So, so just that complete denial of reality, that complete detachment from what is obvious and true is, is not confined to Liz Truss. So Ella Braverman is doing it now, and in many ways with her, albeit that Truss is sharing platforms with some profoundly racist and Islamophobic people, and indeed some profoundly anti-Semitic people, um, the stakes with Braverman from a domestic point of view are probably rather higher. Ten minutes after ten is the time. Here's an example. Jack's been in touch. James, you never condemn Hamas or call for them to surrender. Jack, you're an idiot, mate. I, I don't know how to deal with people like you, except to, to call you an idiot. I condemn Hamas and I call for them to surrender and hand over the hostages, just as almost everybody who is begging Israel to stop killing Palestinians would do as well. Um, but I guess, Jack, you have to cling to a belief like that in order to keep the realisation that you are on completely the wrong side of history at bay. Here is somebody saying, please stop killing Palestinian children. In order to disagree with that person you have to say why aren't you calling for Hamas to to hand over the hostage because I am but as soon as I do that what happens to you and your failure to call for the Israeli army to stop killing Palestinian children where does that leave you I'll tell you where that leaves you mate that leaves you in favor of more killing of more completely innocent children if you're too frightened to say that out loud I'll say it for you let's move on to the less febrile territory now of Scottish independence that was a vaguely sarcastic comment, although, again, the stakes are considerably less high. What I want you to do, I want you to explain the, 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 the strength of feeling to me, because I missed it yesterday. I missed it partly because I hadn't watched the events in Westminster, and I missed it mainly because I didn't see how relatively arcane parliamentary procedural points could have assumed a significance and a weight in the minds of the SNP MPs that seemed to me to dwarf the importance of a vote for a ceasefire in Gaza. And I am still struggling with that. I'm still struggling to understand why the opportunity to vote against a to vote for a ceasefire would be of less significance to Stephen Flynn and his colleagues than the Speaker's capitulation to the Labour Party on a question of which motions stroke amendments would be put to a vote in the House of Commons. But I am coming to a better understanding of that. In fact, by the end of yesterday's programme, I had come to a better understanding of that. And I had a little bit of help in doing so, but it, but it boils down to this. And this, I think, is something that English listeners need a lot of help from Scottish listeners in properly understanding. It boils down to a sense that Scottish national so SNP MPs and indeed the whole of Scotland is a poor relation in the United Kingdom. It boils down to a belief that you are um, subject to political tides over which you have no control. And that, of course, informs a desire for independence. But in the context of Westminster politics, it, it also feeds a notion that you are second-class citizens in the House of Commons and second-class citizens even in the United Kingdom. So here's what I want you to do today. I want you to explain to me properly why... Lindsay Hoyle's capitulation to the Labour request for their amendment to be prioritised against parliamentary precedent and against the uh, uh, express wishes of the Clerk of the House 
I wanted you to explain to me why that was such an egregious affront to the SNP. Not, not so much to parliamentary procedure, because it wasn't entirely unprecedented. But I want to understand why, or rather, I want other people to understand why, that was such a big deal, to use a nicely comprehensible phrase, because someone's just told me they've had to Google capitulation. So I want you to explain to me why that was such a big deal that it was able to, it was able to overshadow the opportunity to actually vote for a ceasefire albeit one that didn't include an accusation against Israel that they had already committed war crimes. That, that was essentially the only difference between the motion and the amendment. So this is an opportunity for me to restore my um, New Year's resolution of 2023, which was to do a much better job of reflecting Scottish, Northern Irish and Welsh politics on a programme that is obviously based in London physically and possibly... Um, uh, 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 ideologically as well. So it is coming up to quarter past 10. The thing that I find most persuasive perhaps is this. Every single SNP MP, as far as I'm aware, has signed a vote of no confidence in the Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle. Now, I felt sorry for him yesterday when we played out the um, recording of his apology to the House of Commons, and I felt sorry for him again when I heard him live apologising again to the House of Commons yesterday. So he did it on Wednesday and he did it on Thursday. Hearing a politician apologise at all is such a rare experience that it catches you. But I think you have to mard a guard against that sympathy. I think from a, from a Scottish point of view, whether you're pro-independence or against independence, it is the SNP essentially that represent you more than any other party in Parliament. The third biggest grouping in Parliament have completely lost faith in the Speaker of the House of Commons for what seemed to me to be quite reasonable reasons. And yet, I'd say the threat to his position seems to have passed. So... For people who spent much of yesterday confused about why the SNP had got their knickers in such a twist, why they were so angry, so cross, this is your opportunity to explain. All right? The thing I'll push back on, and this might make for quite uh, um, high-energy exchanges, the thing I'll push back on is that the Labour Party did anything wrong in asking for it because it spared Keir Starmer a world of trouble. Whether or not Lindsay Hoyle should have granted it is a very different question, a very, very different question. So in your own words, why were the SNP so furious with what happened in the House of Commons on Wednesday? And it's got to be gross, hasn't it? If the third largest grouping in the Commons... That's the reason why, by the way, the PMQs goes to Stephen Flynn after, uh, after Keir Starmer. It doesn't go to the Liberal Democrats. The SNP have more MPs, the third largest political party in the UK Parliament, have completely lost faith in the Speaker of the House of Commons, but he's going to stay in his job. You look an SNP activist, MP or merely supporter, you look them in the eye and tell them that they're equals to the other parties in the House of Commons when they are unanimous in calling for the Speaker to go because they have lost confidence in his ability to lead the Commons. And you tell them they haven't got a point. All right? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. It's 17 minutes after 10. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Just, just, just take a moment out of your morning to explain... Why what Lindsay Hoyle did on Wednesday was so offensive to the SNP, all right? Or challenge the idea that it was. You're welcome to do that. But I think in the first instance, I, I'm personally more interested in the former, all right? 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. It's 1018. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 21 minutes after 10 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. From, from the outside, without a perhaps proper understanding of Scottish politics, the idea that you would allow a grievance about parliamentary procedure to overshadow your clear and long-expressed desire for a ceasefire in Gaza is rather hard to understand. But I think, I think that position is unfair to the SNP. So... Um, 
Just trying to clarify it a little today. Let's start in Perthshire with Fiona. Fiona, what would you like to say? Good morning. I I just feel that the SNP are constantly being told that uh, the voices of Scotland through SNP will be heard and will be part of Westminster. Yet when we try to bring something to attention, which the SNP have been trying to bring forward, the ceasefire vote and the information about ceasefire to the fore, and we get so few chances to speak up and so few chances to go forward. Yet yesterday, the whole thing, or sorry, Wednesday, the whole thing was swept aside in a way that was really unacceptable. I still and don't. I, I, so, but the whole day of debate was about the ceasefire, and we can all thank the SNP for that, using one of their opposition days, using one of their three opposition days to throw open the House of Commons to, to a meaningful and often passionate conversation about what's going on in Gaza. Incredible uh, speeches in, in support of the ceasefire from all over the House. And then because the Speaker decided that the vote would be on the Labour amendment to, rather than the SNP's motion both of which were in favour of a ceasefire, the SNP... So what your analysis sounds like, done. it sounds like it's you're... Dis- no, hang on. Done. It sounds like you're describing the SNP being told that they couldn't choose what was going to be debated in the House of Commons on Wednesday, whereas, of course, they did. The way it's been done, and it's been the straw that has broken the camel's back, it may be optics, it may be... But you can't say case. that, because that's not just that it may be optics. If it's optics versus Gaza, that's disgusting. No, <laughs> no, it's very well, it much is. a case. It's very much a case. It's SNP have been trying to bring this to the fore, and I can understand why somebody would say there's an element of. Um, I, th- I think the SNP was treated appallingly, but I can't get to the point where you are, where you think that in the context of the opportunity to vote for a ceasefire in Gaza, that even matters at all. And and I have some sympathy of that where where it didn't look great that w- w- there was an element of, OK, well, th- that's it then, w- we're really angry. But you yeah. don't understand why no, I don't. we're really angry. Oh, I do, I and do, because because I did. That was what my whole introduction was about. I do understand. I don't feel it like you feel it because I, cause I'm not, I'm not a, not a Scottish supporter of Scottish independence. The programme the other day was quite, specific, was quite specifically obvious to to many yes. that you just do not understand the depth of feeling, the background... Well, of course I understand the depth why. of feeling, but I don't approve of it. I, I don't approve of your depth of feeling about parliamentary procedure trumping the opportunity to vote for a ceasefire in Gaza. It seems to me to be grim, and you're welcome to explain to me what I'm missing in that analysis. Well, I, I do feel very strongly that Scotland were denied their opportunity to present this in the way that it, it had been tabled. And but, that's... But, but the whole day was about that. The whole day of debate was about that. Going home, walking out, rather than taking... rather, I mean, it was the Tories that scuppered the opportunity to a vote, which again puts the SNP in bed with the Tories, which is something that I think <laughs> progressive... Um, uh, uh, England, it, pro- progressive English voters find quite hard to understand. But, but prioritising the justifiable anger over what the Speaker did, prioritising that over the opportunity to support a ceasefire in Gaza. Just that's the bit I don't get. My understanding, and I fully admit that I, I do not understand all the complexities of the way the, the voting I don't think anybody happened, does. But, I don't think anybody does. But, but the story became I, SNP anger rather than dead Palestinians, didn't it? And I accept that. And whose fault is that? Well, why are we angry? No. Why, why, whose fault is it that the story became SNP anger rather than dead Palestinians? Well, no, I, 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 I can understand why we're angry and I can understand that the media have jumped on that. It's not and the media, though, is it? Stephen Flynn led, led the MPs out of the House of Commons. That's a huge um, attention-drawing event. 
The attacks and upon Lindsay Hoyle, tea. the attacks upon the, Lindsay the, Hoyle the were more passionate people. than the attacks upon the Israeli government. Do you know what I take away from it? I've got some breaking news I have to share, Fiona. But I, I, okay. I, I increasingly see why Sinn Féin didn't take up their seats in the House that of Commons. That is the point that I was just about to make. Is it really? I'm beginning to understand. I never understood it. I thought being there, back for your your cause, have discussion, have debate, have. And my point about the whole thing of them walking out is because it just feels like the straw that breaks and, and, the camel's And that, back. I think, is the Scotland, point. If I may just finish No, you can't. I, you, I, I've got to break this news. I may come back to you, but um, but I can tell you that Shamima Begum has just lost her latest appeal over the removal of her citizenship, a decision taken, I think, by Sajid Javid when he was Home Secretary that has now been uphold, upheld by a number of courts. Lady Chief Justice Dame Sue Carr delivered the ruling. We do have a reporter um, at the court who will share details of that ruling shortly. But I can tell you that the, the original finding, the baseline finding, is that the removal of Shamima Begum, who ran away or stroke was trafficked to um, join ISIS at the age of 15 and had her citizenship removed as a consequence, which robs her of any right to return to the United Kingdom. Um, that, that, has, that, that appeal has failed. So more on that to come. And luckily, we have got time for you to conclude your point, Fiona. But if you could do it briefly, because I want to squeeze in Finley before the news. Um, I, I feel that more and more I understand why no longer taking part in Westminster is is uh, relevant to Scotland because we get told up in Scotland all the time, we want your voice, we want you to be part of Labour government going forward, we want this, we, you will be um, you will be heard, you will be listened to, and frankly, we just felt like it, the feet had been taken away from us. All right, the one more question. Well, one, more, one more question. Why didn't the SNP put forward a motion that Labour could have voted for? not her job to to um mollycoddle labor oh so that's more important than the ceasefire no 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 you're you're you know i i agree that perhaps in the situation no but if the ceasefire was more important if the ceasefire was more important of 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 political leaders work fiona if the ceasefire was more important than if setting case, setting a trap for did, Labour. Why didn't Starmer allow his MPs to vote on the Scottish one then? Because it involves an accusation of war crimes against Israel and uh, all being well, by the end of the year, Starmer will be in charge of our diplomatic mission but to Israel it, by the for way peace. Done, uh, because oh, the come Labour on, mate, won- I've, I've just answered your question completely and you haven't answered mine. That's, why, you- that's why Starmer can't whip his... I can't, can't support his... MPs voting because he will be uh, uh, quite possibly leading our diplomatic mission to Israel, suing for peace before the end of the year. He well, can't do that if he's. He can't. He's hang, on, hang, on, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. He can't do people. that. He can't do that if he's allowed his MPs, if he's whipped his votes to, to his MPs to vote for a motion that calls them war criminals for good or for Have ill. That's that's the that's the diplomatic to, to reality. His motion to the. Parliament. No, you can't, you can't, you can't gloss the, over the what Scottish I'm saying. He's quite happy to take the you can't gloss over what I'm saying. renewables and everything else from Scotland, yeah. but he's not even allowing the so Again, the something that's got nothing to do with the ceasefire. You're citing. Quite, quite it? but it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And that's, my, that's my fear. That, that's what I'm worried. Months. Fiona, that's what I was worried about. Is, and, I mean, people are free to offer up different analyses, but the idea that our sense of grievance was greater than our desire for a ceasefire is essentially what what I've just heard from you. And I've answered your question about why he couldn't whip his MPs to vote for the Scottish motion. As Stephen Flynn well understands, a, a politician I'm very impressed by. I've met him. I like him. But he set a trap for Labour. And the fury is that it didn't work. And that fury, I think, transcended the sincere and deep desire for a ceasefire in Gaza. And that's why everything looks so ugly and indeed so confusing. Um, listen, these are just, just observations based on fact. And, and if, if your position comes from feeling, from straws that broke camels' backs, from years of feeling ignored and, and democratically dispossessed, none of that matters in the crucible of that single moment. What's more important, anger at the speaker or Palestinian civilians still getting killed in Gaza. I, that, to me, is how it breaks down. But I look forward to you telling me why it's not that simple. 10.31 is the time. Thomas Watts has your headline. James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.35. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Trying to, trying to unravel and probably failing, probably doomed to fail because it is, I think, unrealistic to expect an unravelling, particularly with regard to Scottish independence and, and centuries of shabby treatment from London. It is un, unfair, perhaps, to expect anybody to be able to unravel that emotional weight from the dry procedural and intellectual events of Wednesday. And and if that sounds condescending and patronising, that's only because you're determined to believe that it is. It, it really isn't. Explain to me how justifiable anger at what Lindsay Hoyle did on Wednesday could have prompted um, events that ended up overshadowing anger and unhappiness that ended up overshadowing the desperate need for a ceasefire in Gaza, especially when the SNP have been ahead of the game on all of this from the start, been calling for it long before the Labour Party got their house in order, for good or for ill. That was the SNP's lead. They owned it. And then on Wednesday, they ended up angrier about parliamentary procedure than they were about the unfolding situation in Gaza. At least that's how it looked from the outside. And, and I'd, I'd be very, very grateful to see things differently. Uh, as I mentioned to you mo a, a moment ago, Shamina Begum has lost her appeal over the removal of her citizenship. Helen Hoddenut is at the Court of Appeal for LBC. Uh, what do we know about the ruling, Helen? Well, Lady Chief Justice Dame Sue Carr delivered today's judgment. She started by outlining the background to the case, how Shamima Begum travelled to Syria in 2015, aged just 15 years old, to join IS. Once there, she married an ISIL fighter and went on to have three children, all of whom sadly died. Now, as we know, she was discovered in 2019 in a refugee camp in northern Syria, and the then home Secretary Sajid Javid stripped her of her British citizenship, meaning she could not return to the UK. And that set in motion a five-year legal battle during which her lawyers have argued that the government have failed to consider legal duties owed to a potential victim of trafficking and claim that the UK has failed to have a full and effective investigation into how she ended up in Syria. On the other hand, lawyers for the government say that the key feature of this case is national security and argued that the public should not be exposed to risks as a result of the case. Now, a year ago yesterday, her last appeal was dismissed uh, when the tribunal concluded that despite dismissing the appeal, there was credible suspicion uh, that Shamima Begum was trafficked to Syria for sexual exploitation and that there were arguable breaches of duty by state bodies in allowing her to travel to the country. The ruling delivered today was about whether that decision last year was lawful. And summing up, Lady Chief Justice Dame Sue Carr delivered a conclusion. She said it could be argued that the decision in Miss Begum's case was harsh. It could also be argued that Miss Begum is the author of her own fortune, but it is not for the court to agree or disagree with either point of view. She said the only task of the court was to assess whether the deprivation decision was unlawful. Since it was not, Miss Begum's appeal is dismissed. So this is the latest chapter, James, but it is probably unlikely to be the last that we hear of this long-running legal battle. Because the Supreme Court awaits. Yes, there are more There are more avenues to go down. So that was a really interesting explanation, Helen. Thank you. And, and for doing it it's so concisely as well. So, so it isn't actually a judgment on the merits of the case. It's simply on the application of the law at the last hearing. Yeah, super technical legal wording used all the way through the delivery of that of that decision. Um, Helen Hoddenot, live from the Court of Appeal, where, as you've heard, Shamima Begum has lost her appeal over removal of citizenship. She was, of course, 15 when she left her home in England to to join ISIS. The circumstances of that journey and that departure, as Helen reminded us, are um, are moot, uh, but not the uh, uh, the basis necessarily for the judgment today. Well, not the basis today for the judgment handed down by Lady Chief Justice Dame Sue Carr. We may talk about this in the in the next hour with with a couple of caveats. But um, 
Well, I'll tell you in the next hour what those what those caveats are. There's quite a lot coming up today. It is, as you know, the second anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So we'll catch up shortly after the next hiatus with Luke Harding, one of the journalists that has been closest to the action pretty much from the outset. He is in Kyiv. Um, uh, then we will, later in the programme, perhaps just after half past 12, we'll catch up with Kira Riddick, who is uh, the leader of one of the Ukrainian political parties and a very, very passionate advocate of what Bill Browder was talking to us about earlier this week and indeed earlier this year and indeed late last year. Uh, and the, the rest of the world seems to have caught, the rest of the UK media seems to have caught up with the necessity of, of, of uh, sequestering this three hundred billion dollars worth of frozen Russian assets that could immediately be put to work to help Ukraine. And then finally, we'll hear from Professor Anthony King at the University of Exeter, who has been one of our um, sagest guides through the complications of the actual warfare. He, of course, is a professor of defence and security studies. So a lot to come. And then at 10 to 12, Lewis Goodall will join us um, with news of an investigation he's undertaken into the man that's trying to buy the Daily Telegraph. And if you think my warning about the mainstreaming of the most vile Islamophobia was perhaps a, a little extreme itself, then uh, Lewis's investigation into someone called Paul Marshall, who is one of the owners of GB News or GBBs, as it is affectionately known, um, that, that I think will take away any suspicions you may have that I am unduly worried about the conflation, if you like, of, of far-right extremism with increasingly, quote, mainstream, end quote, media. 10.41 is the time. Back to the SNP and, and an idiot's guide, an English idiot's guide to why they were so cross on Wednesday. And in this guise, in this role, I am categorically the English idiot. I want to make that absolutely clear. But I still don't quite get it. Alan's in Fife. Alan, what would you like to say? Uh, morning, Jane. Hello, mate. First of all, then, so bear with the nerves. Don't so be silly. I, I think there's a balance missing somewhere from this conversation, and I, and I feel it myself. So I'm really angry. I was really angry on the day yeah. at, at SNP got stamped all over, and then common sense starts to creep in. So, that, so I'm also angry about the fact that, that we didn't get a powerful, meaningful, impactful result from, from the resolution. Mm. There was nothing wrong with res la a Labour's resolution, but where is it? it it's lost its power in the wrangling. So so where was the consensus? And I think that that's where, where my anger really is. Where, if, if Scotland is important, where was the consensus? Where were the conversations with the Speaker? Why was this not sorted out almost behind closed doors so that we could have a proper debate? I completely agree with you. I, 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 I mean, I don't know how many times I need to say I think the SNP were treated appallingly, but that doesn't lead... And I, and I wouldn't have that sense of anger that you had in the moment, would I? Because because I'm nowhere near as invested in it as you are. And 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 yet, when your anger dissipated, you're left wondering why the spotlight has moved away from Gaza and onto Westminster. So, so I think that's only only natural. And I, and I think to to push, I, I don't know if you're arguing this, but to push too much of that onto the SNP, I think, is unfair. The whole of Parliament yeah. should work around these issues. But but at any time in Scotland d debate, it, it masks is part of it. We're a small part of the UK, so the UK should should get what it wants. But where's the representation? There was just nothing from Scotland. There was no nod to it. In the moment, that's infuriating. I, I completely agree, and I, and I completely see it. I just I'm missing one connection, aren't I? Really, and I think it's because of the the the, the subject matter. Would it be fair, do you think, to suggest that the subject matter it almost gets squeezed out by that? completely justifiable and very well explained sense of inferiority. No, that comes out wrong. The sense that you are being treated as inferiors by the Westminster machine. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the subject is before the House, the evidence that we are being treated unfairly is so egregious that I cannot let it pass. And then that's where we are. Yeah, it's a frustration because I honestly wish the SNP had dealt with it slightly differently. I'd been able to go to go to Takia, go to the Speaker. But that puts all the emphasis on the SNP, of course, and that's my problem with it. But honestly, yeah, on the day... It does, you're right. And that's not yeah. fair. That's not fair. But I do think the killer question is perhaps why couldn't they put forward a motion that Labour could have voted for? So that's politics and that's, that's a difficult one. But it shouldn't be politics on this issue, though, should it? Again, we're back to that dichotomy aren't we of the gravity and the size of the issue versus parliament versus point scoring and trap setting i think 
and and Starmer at least as guilty of that as as anybody else. He got himself off a massive hook by intervening with the Speaker in a way that he is perfectly entitled to do, but the Speaker should never have capitulated. So there was an element of game playing to that, and I, and I did I, I honestly did wonder if, if if the FNP if the foot was on the other shoe, I'm yeah. not right that wrong. The, the, the Speaker would never have have let FNP do that on on an opposition day. No, I, I, again, I completely agree with that. And, and, and overturning precedent is, is problematic. It is a bad thing, however persuasive uh, Lindsay Hoyle's explanations might have been. But, but Starmer asking him to do it seems to me to be um, the opposite of what he's usually criticised for, which is being too cautious and pussyfooting around things. He's gone in there with his studs up and he's, and he's hobbled Lindsay Hoyle. But Lindsay Hoyle didn't have to go down. He didn't have to do what he did. I, get, I, I mean, I don't know if it's unrealistic to be searching for two sentences that unlock this whole issue in a way that allows everybody to see that the SNP were treated abominably in the House of Commons by Lindsay Hoyle, but that it is... It is it is a situation partly of their own making. A motion that Labour could have voted for would have prioritised the people of Gaza over everybody in Westminster. And as it is, we're left thinking that people in Westminster, Keir Starmer included, prioritise themselves over everybody in Gaza. I don't understand why the conversation doesn't happen and, and I'm just not close enough to what the relationships are like because that's obviously how it should have been done. But but that seems to be very much politics, not just... It does, politics. and it seems to be it seems to be a, perhaps a, a more recent development because Stephen Flynn has, I think, very impressively been a hell of a lot more robust in going after Labour than um, than Ian Blackford was. Uh, and, and you can see why. The electoral arithmetic in Scotland means that the SNP is fighting Labour on fronts that it wasn't fighting them at previous, certainly not in 2019 and, and, and nowhere near as much in 2016. So, you know, we forget that sometimes. But, but again, this central point of recognising the absolutely appalling way in which the SNP were treated, but wondering why it's been allowed to overshadow the cause to which they have been committed since November still needs a little bit of work. It really does. 0345 6060973 oh, is the number that you need. It's 1047. Um, Labour had a motion the SNP could have voted for, um, and, and they chose instead, writes Jason, not me, to, to um, hide away and complain after the game was over. Oh, and Rick writes, you are the epitome of a client journalist. Shameful, um, which is absolutely your prerogative to say that, Rick. But I don't know who you think I'm shilling for. When I say the SNP was treated abominably, are you accusing me of being too uh, blindly supportive of them and their position or too critical of it? I think that question might be a little bit too complicated for a bear of little brain. Um, up next, Luke Harding, journalist, author of Invasion, Russia's Bloody War and Ukraine's Fight for Survival. He's in Kiev and he will be the first of our guests today to tell us what he thinks we should be talking about with regard to um, the war in general and the second anniversary in particular. It's 10.48. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.52. Bizarrely, I, I, I think Lindsay Hoyle's position should be untenable. And it proves the SNP's point that it isn't. The third largest grouping in the House of Commons have completely lost faith in the Speaker for a mistake he has admitted, albeit he's apologised for. That's not good enough. We have lost faith in you because of the mistake that you made. And the mistake was hugely damaging to our status in the chamber, to our status in Westminster. So Hoyle's position becomes untenable. And I, I, I'm not trying to annoy everybody today, but I arrive at that conclusion just as the heat seems to be coming off him because that motion of no confidence seemed to stall at around 5, 6 o'clock yesterday evening. A, a quick glance in Idiot's Corner. Here's Archie and Inverness. The blubbing Lindsay Hoyle could not have a more loyal or unquestioning ally than you, James. Maybe you've saved his job for him. Um, thanks, Archie. Good to, good to, always good to um, hear from people. But I, I think his position's untenable, mate. I don't know about what it is about that word you find hard to understand. Uh, let me think of a simpler one. How about um, I, I don't, I don't think he should have his job. But we move to more important matters, namely the second anniversary of the invasion of Kiev. Luke Harding has been there for much of the duration and is indeed there now the author of russia's bloody war and ukraine's fight for survival um i hope this isn't a, a, an ambush question but what should we be talking about today in your view luke 
Well, uh, James, I, I mean, I, I think the fact that y Ukraine's war, as you say, it's, it's two year anniversary um, tomorrow is, is not just Ukraine's war, it's our war as well. Um, and I, I think at a time where people talk of Ukraine fatigue, uh, they want to kind of change channel or do something else. Um, and the first thing to say is that the, 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 the war is still going on. Three people died today in Odessa. Russia is bombing Ukrainian towns and cities. There are Ukrainian soldiers dying every hour. The front line looks like something out of a kind of Netflix First World War drama with snowy trenches and pings and thumps and booms, but with 21st century technology and drones, you know, buzzing in the air. Um, it's Europe's biggest war since 1945. And I think there is a compelling moral case for us not to lose interest. But also, there's an equally um, compelling political case in that Vladimir Putin's goals, which we've talked about before on this show, mm -hmm. are as maximalist as ever. He thinks he's winning. He last week took the, the eastern city of Avdiivka after a bloody five-month assault. Um, and if Putin is not stopped, he, he will not stop. The Ukrainians say this. I think it's true. Uh, I think the Baltic states are very much uh, in, in Putin's crosshairs. Moldova, potentially. Poland. Putin wants to reshape the world. He he thinks he's in a big, eternal, Manichaean battle with the West in general, with America in particular, in the UK. Um, and he, what, he looks around. He looks at British politics. He looks at American politics. He sees weakness. He sees division. He sees hesitation. And he thinks things are going his way. So, so we need to keep faith with Ukraine. We need to support Ukraine. And most of all, we need to arm Ukraine. And, and are, are we doing less than we were before at the moment? Some of the stories of Ukrainian positions running out of ammunition are chilling. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was, I, I'm going to the front line next week. I was there last month uh, in a place called Kupensk, which is about six kilometers from Russian positions. Uh, and the Russians are firing 10 artillery shells for every one that the Ukrainians can fire. Um, and the, the the soldiers I was talking to were saying, look, you know, we, we know they have more guys. They, they've mobilized. They have taken people from remote Russian villages and ethnic republics. Um, uh, that's not the problem. The problem is artillery. Uh, well, and also aviation. Of course, Russia's got this powerful air force and, and the Ukrainians have got practically no air force at all and no navy. Um, and it all depends on on, on the West. And, and the, the, the blunt fact is that U.S. Republicans, um, under the influence of Donald Trump, it, in the House have blocked a $60 billion package of, of military support for Ukraine. That, that is existential for those guys. As a result of that, not only are Ukrainian soldiers dying, but Ukrainian civilians are dying as well. Um, and, and the Europeans, meanwhile, are, are, are trying to kind of ramp up defense production. But slowly and not at scale at a time when Russia has really remodeled its economy, turned it into war economy um, and is, is, is really sort of pushing forward. So, so we, we are in a, in a pretty kind of precarious um, situation. And where I am in Kiev, last year, you would hear an air raid siren at three in the morning, you would go back to sleep because you, you knew that it would be intercepted. Right. Now, now you put on your flat jacket and you go to the basement because oh. a lot of the stuff is getting through and landing chaotically everywhere. Couldn't be a worse time then for major elections in the West in terms, yeah, of, in terms and, of attention and, and possible regime change. That's right. I mean, I, I, I do think, I mean, what, what, you know, one other point is that, that I, I just met with some Ukrainian defense officials this morning and I, I had to sort of explain to them that Boris Johnson was no longer the prime minister. Everyone loves Boris Johnson here, by the way, your, your mm. good friend, James. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, that, that Labour was coming, Keir Starmer was going to be the new prime minister um, and that they should try and start talking to Labour now. But also I think there's an opportunity for Labour, quite a kind of counterintuitive one insofar as if Labour becomes the party of, of, of strong defence, of standing up to Russia, uh, that, that reinvests in British steel, in British manufacturing, in making shells and ammunition, that that would bring us closer together with Europe. It would help the Ukrainians. It would invest in, in depressed areas of the country. I think there's an obvious and easy win for Labour should, should, they, should they do it. I mean, no, they're, no, they're talking about it. Can they actually do it? If they can actually do it, that would benefit everybody. And finally, Lou, what, what should we be looking out for? I, I mean, in terms of best and worst case scenarios, what might be the next big event to unfold? 
<clears throat> I mean, I, I don't think the Russians are going to be able to take Kiev, where I am, or Kharkiv, or any of the other major cities. Uh, uh, what I fear is that they will slowly but surely kind of grind forward a village here, a town mm. there, um, and that the, the story of this war becomes one of inevitable Russian victory. It's one the Kremlin is already pushing. That that That's the worst case scenario. I think the best case scenario is that, that we get our act together, we help the Ukrainians, um, we continue to show an interest and that they can more or less kind of consolidate and defend and, and possibly move forward next year. But it's, James, it's going to be a long war. I suspect you and I will be talking again. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it, it's the defining war in, in our neighborhood in our century. And yes. I, I just want people to, to continue to engage with it. Well, we should, we should certainly talk more, uh, actually, your opening words about the, 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 I think you used the word fatigue is something we should all guard against. And thank you for helping us to do that, Luke Harding, who is in Kiev um, uh, and the author of Invasion, Russia's Bloody War and Ukraine's Fight. I'd, I'd remind you as well that Liz Truss is currently at a far right conference in America sitting next to Nigel Farage, who has described Vladimir Putin as the politician he admires most in the world. So, um, yeah, you, you know, the, it's not just fatigue, is it? It's actual engines seeking to drive in the opposite direction from the one from the one that Luke describes. And I, I, drawn to the conversation about how much attention we could pay to Liz Truss, who has gone completely bonkers, or we'll have a conversation next about Shamima Begum's latest failure to overturn the decision to revoke her. British citizenship. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The time is 11 o'clock. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after 11 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. It's funny, as we prepare to talk about Liz Truss, Dominic Raab starts bleeping on my radar. He is... Um, He's taking advice from a leadership and career transition service provider as he embarks on a new £118,000 a year job for a private equity mining company. This is according to the latest MP's Register of Interests. Stepping down at the next election um, has listed uh, pro bono services worth £20,000 from Manchester Square Partners. This is um, a company that describes itself as giving trusted advice uh, a trusted advisor to leaders defined by discretion and hidden by design with a purpose to support leaders to be in control of their futures. Me neither. I don't know who the hell is in control of Liz Truss's future. Rob and Truss were uh, both co-authors, weren't they, of that dreadful Britannia Unchained book that called you the laziest workers in the world? You, the British, if you're British, you're, you're, you're among the laziest workers in the world, according to Dominic Raab, who ended up Deputy Prime Minister, and... Uh, Liz Truss, who ended up Prime Minister, Kwasi Kwarteng, who ended up Chancellor of the Exchequer. Who else was on that list? Chris Skidmore was on it. He ended up resigning from the government in protest at their failure to tackle climate change. There was, was there one other? Truss, Raab, Skidmore, Kwarteng. Was that, anyway, I digress. Um, here is a really... New, you know how sometimes it feels. I, I wouldn't like to think it ever feels like Groundhog Day on this program, possibly in the immediate aftermath of Brexit or even during the pandemic. I think necessarily we found ourselves returning to the same central topic time and time and time again, and it was quite correct to do so. But here's a new one. I, I, I mean, I can't quite believe I'm asking you this question. I'm not going to ask you whether or not Liz Truss has gone completely crackers because I don't think you'd ring in. I think that's too vague an inquiry. I'm going to play you a clip instead of somebody else who is currently at a conference called CPAC, which is a, a far-right gathering in America um, of... In fact, someone's just sent me a message saying, would you define far-right, please? The term has lost all meaning. No, mate, that's what people who are from the far-right like to claim when seeking to sanitise... Or, or dilute their own extremism. Uh, it, it's fairly easy to define far right, and if you can't use Google, then I may do it for you. But in the meantime, luckily, one of the other speakers at this conference that Liz Truss has attended with Steve Bannon and Nigel Farage does a pretty good job of at least showing you what it sounds like. So this is, I, I kid you not, this is the same gathering that the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Liz Truss, is currently attending. All right, welcome. Welcome. I just wanted to say look, welcome to the end of democracy. 
<laughs> we are here to overthrow it completely. We didn't get all the way there on January 6th, but we will we, we will endeavor to, oh, forget, oh, to get rid oh. of it and replace it with, with this right here. We'll replace it with this right, right. here. Amen. I, 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 I don't know whether I'm going crackers sometimes, but just imagine for a minute if Diane Abbott turned up at an event where another speaker was calling for the end of democracy and boasting about their associations with people who actually launched a coup upon the, an attempted coup upon the uh, uh, American government after Donald Trump lost the last election. I, 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 I struggle to get my head around this because I've written a book, and that's not bad, is it? I got to 11.07 today without mentioning it. I've written a book about the madness that allowed Liz Truss to become Prime Minister and Boris Johnson. But the one thing I never actually expected to happen, the one thing I never expected to happen was Liz Truss having ceased to be Prime Minister, dedicating the rest of her life to proving all of the points that I have made in the book. The, the complete detachment from reality, the scaremongering, the provocations, the, the I, I, I'm never quite clear on, I, I, can't, I can't cut my cloth according to every single complaint that comes into the program. So for, if I use a word and one person gets upset, but a hundred other people in the same place don't get upset, I, I, don't, I can't limit my vocabulary completely, but I need a word that describes Liz Truss's detachment from reality that wouldn't apparently offend people with with mental health problems and i i respect that i really do i don't like causing unnecessary offense i, I want to make that absolutely clear i am a huge huge fan of causing necessary offense make, make no mistake if you're a far-right snowflake then i love offending you and your gammony sensibilities absolutely love it especially when you start whining and bleating in exactly the way that you always accuse other people of doing i think it's brilliant it's beautiful it's a joy to behold but i don't want to upset people unnecessarily i don't want to upset people who don't deserve to be upset so i'm never quite sure what language to take what language to use I, crackers doesn't actually go far enough um, have I, I, I've got some clips of, of Liz Truss speaking. Yes, there's a full 15-minute speech that she gave, and I want you to hear some bits of it. The, the, but, the, um, but the question I've got for you is essentially whether or not you can ignore her, right? I, I, I mean, listen, Farage has been punting this filth for years, and he's been turning up at this disgusting conference for years, and he's been given a free pass by most right-wing media for, for years. And, you know, the Telegraph essentially is recasting itself in his, in his image. You've got this character who we're going to be hearing about with Lewis Goodall at 11.45, paying him to present little-watched programmes on, on a television station designed to give a patina of legitimacy to um, deluded, stroke, disgusting political positions. That's been going on for years and and that is Farage's shtick that's what he does he moves effortlessly from anti-semitism when he describes the Jewish lobby in America being too powerful to Islamophobia when he talks about fifth columns and he doesn't believe in anything but you know that and and a lot of people in rooms like this one in America don't really believe in anything except the the power the wealth and influence generating power of hatred, of, of, of generating hatred. So it would be nice if everyone could ignore Nigel Farage. Um, but they don't. And that's fair enough. It's a, it's a commercial business model. He knows exactly where the line is, like um, Anjem Chowdhury and Tommy, little Tommy Ten names before him. He knows exactly where the line is between um, criminality and provocation. And unlike those other two characters, he is well educated enough not to cross it. So that's fine. But she's a former prime minister. So should it matter more? Here's two minutes, right? Two minutes of, of Liz Truss speaking at a conference in America where another speaker has called for the end of democracy. I'm not saying I'm a perfect person or I did everything exactly right. But I face the most almighty backlash for those conservative policies that I tried to put in place. It, from the usual suspects in the media, from the usual suspects in the corporate world, but also from people that were meant to work for the government. The Office of Budget Responsibility, the Bank of England, these organizations sought to undermine the policies. Even the IMF intervened 
and even President Biden intervened to have a go at my policies. Now, can you imagine being attacked on your economic policies by the inventor of Bidenomics? <laughs> Talk about offensive. But the reality is, with that level of antagonism, I simply was not able to implement those policies, which I believe, and Conservative Party members believe, would have delivered for our country. And frankly, I didn't have enough support from Conservative MPs as well in order to be able to do that. So this is the lesson that I have learnt. I've learnt that it's not enough just to have the right policies. It's not even enough to get the position of power that you need to deliver those policies. Because Conservatives are now operating in what is a hostile environment. And we essentially need a bigger bazooka in order to be able to deliver. And I think we have got to challenge the institutions themselves. We've got to challenge the system itself. And we've got to be prepared to take that on as Conservatives. So a uh, £45 billion pounds worth of unfunded tax cuts that were introduced and were cheered by, uh, I mean, almost all of the UK media. Daily Mail, cometh the hour, cometh the woman. At last, a true Tory budget. Daily Express, put faith in trust to deliver for Britain. Uh, Sunday Telegraph, trust plans to cut taxes again in, in New Year. A, a, extraordinary uh, levels of support for the madness that her and Kwasi Kwarteng inflicted upon the country. I mean, truly extraordinary levels of support, some of which continued for quite a long time. And there she is in America talking about being more sinned against than sinning, blaming uh, the International Monetary Fund is the lender of last resort internationally. It's an organisation that bails out bankrupt companies. It bailed out the United Kingdom in, I think, 1974. And the advice that it offers... Uh, the guidance and the forecasts that it publishes are designed to help countries avoid the bankruptcy from which the IMF would be required to bail them out. So when you hear Liz Truss attacking them, she's doing some, so from a position either of abject ignorance or of very, very deliberate danger. And the question I've got for you, that even though she was only prime minister for 49 days... Should we be paying attention to this descent into political madness or should we be completely ignoring it? OK, that, that's I think and it may only be an important question for one day only. But I think today that's quite an important question. She is she's there with Steve Bannon sitting next to Steve Bannon, who has told people to wear the accusation of racism proudly. She is on the same stage as that bloke you heard at the beginning, who's some sort of um, influential YouTuber. Uh, calling for the end of democracy to be replaced uh, essentially by precisely the people who attend events like this. Uh, it, as things move from the fringe to the edges of the mainstream, should those of us who treasure the mainstream, because it's neither extremist nor detached from reality, pay more or less attention to Liz Truss. And you have to remove the words Liz Truss from your contemplations here. And you have to instead focus upon a former British Prime Minister. So Dave's been in touch already. He says, James, you're giving her oxygen. Stop it. And that's a powerful point that could well be right, Dave. But it's a former British Prime Minister. The system isn't really equipped to completely ignore a former British Prime Minister. But then the system wasn't really equipped to stop a lying charlatan like Boris Johnson getting into Downing Street or a, a, a corrupt dictator wannabe like Donald Trump getting into the White House. So that, that's the point, really, Dave, that my question comes from, is that in normal times with normal politics, politicians in a normal country this wouldn't even be a question and that objection of giving oxygen to crazy people would be valid but it's a former british prime minister going crackers in public while claiming somehow to represent the uk to somehow speak for us as she lies and lies and lies again so what do you do what do you do? See, you've got Suella Braverman, a former Home Secretary, peddling rank Islamophobia in the Daily Telegraph. And that is not ignored because the Daily Telegraph promotes it. At what point does Liz Truss become more problematic than she currently is? I don't want to say how crackers does she have to be? 
Should the whip be removed? I mean, some of the stuff blaming the failure of her policies on trans activists in the civil service is... It, 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 I, I, I mean, you just could tell that from my spluttering. It is completely beyond analysis. But, genuinely, should this be the last time we ever talk about Liz Truss? Yes or no? 0345 6060 973. Do you want one more little clip? And then, well, should we do it after the break? We'll come back from the break. I'll give you one more little clip and then we'll have a phone in about whether or not this should be the last time we ever talk about Liz Truss. All right? If you want to book your place in the queue, 0345 973 is the number that you need. It's 1117. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 20 minutes after 11. It's hard to pick the best bit. I, I, I'll tweet the full 15-minute clip if I haven't already. But you, you, she, she starts to... Well, have a listen to this. And, and then tell me whether or not... I'll read you something Nigel sent me from Belfast, which is um, which is actually quite powerful. Uh, I, I, it stopped me in my tracks, to be honest. Remember the complacency of 1920s German politicians regarding Hitler. Depressing though it may be, we must give attention to all the deluded fringes because you never know where they move next. And look, it's a deluded fringe that contains Donald Trump's consigliere, Steve Bannon. It contains um, a, a man who is beloved of the the sort of gammon wing of the Conservative Party, Nigel Farage. I and mean, there is that sense that, that these fringe extremists are moving closer to the mainstream but what but when a former prime minister joins their forces jumps on their um ridiculous bandwagon is nigel right this is nigel boone in belfast not nigel farage at the, at the far right conference in america um should we actually pay attention to it because to look the other way as a consequence of the abject ridiculousness of what you're seeing is to leave them free to flourish in the dark? I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. But if you think I'm exaggerating, try this on for size. What I want to talk most of all about today is the fact that the very basis of Western civilization is being undermined. The values, the Anglo-American values that we hold dear, that were encapsulated in Magna Carta, in the Bill of Rights, in the American Constitution... They're being questioned and undermined. Our history is being challenged. Even our biology is being challenged. Can you imagine, could you have imagined 10 years ago that we'd be talking about what a woman is and what a man is and having a serious argument about it? It's incredible. And yet every issue, the left win, they push it even more. They push it to even more extremes. And meanwhile, we've seen President Biden asleep at the wheel in the White House. Now, in Britain, we are one of the few countries that still have a conservative government. But the left did not accept that they'd lost at the ballot box. Instead, they've been weaponizing our court system to stop us deporting illegal immigrants. They've been using the administrative state to make sure that conservative policies are thwarted. And they've been pushing their woke agenda through our schools, through our campuses, and even in our corporations. Now, I thought that companies in the free market were meant to be about giving people jobs, giving people opportunities, making money, making profits, creating wealth for our country. But no. We've got a new kind of economics now in the West. It's called Wokeonomics. I, 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 she's speaking to a room full of people who deny that Joe Biden won the last election. And she's claiming that the left in the United Kingdom refused to accept the results of... I mean, it can't be the election that saw her achieve power because there wasn't one. But I, I, And then complaining about the law, complaining about teachers teaching, complaining. I, I mean, are there no transgender right-wing people? Why does she conflate transgender people with, with the left wing? It's, it's just a ridiculous position. So I'm going to move this hour from thinking that she's too ridiculous to take seriously to thinking that she's too dangerous to ignore. So what do you think? Too ridiculous to take seriously or too dangerous to ignore? Phil's an Ilfracoon. Phil, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Good to speak to you. Likewise. 
Um, yeah, you, you stole my point. Um, I haven't I made one you, yet. I'm only asking a question. <laughs> you stole my, my, the point I was going to make with your question. Go on. Um, she's too dangerous to ignore. Right. Her, Trump, Andrew Tate, if we try to ignore them, they will spread their message somewhere and it will be somewhere that's unchecked. And therefore, how do we offer balance? How do we make them take responsibility for what they've said? How do we what do you make think sure she's that... playing at on a personal level? I mean, personal stroke, professional level. What do you think she's actually playing at? You know, there's a, there's another universe, Phil. There's a parallel universe in which Remain won the referendum in 2016, and she she would have tried to topple David Cameron from the left of the Conservative Party. I, I you know, as 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 a prominent Remain campaigner, there's a completely parallel universe in which her curious marriage of of enormous ambition and tiny intelligence would have seen her attacking the Tory party from the other side of the political divide. What do you think has happened to her? This is the Tory party in general at the moment, isn't it? There's no politicians there. There's just want to be celebrities. They just want power. They want fame. They want exposure in the hope that it will land them with a massive job that pays them, you know, (laughs) <laughs> hundreds of thousands, if not millions a year. So you just think it is name. just greed, either for, for, for power or for wealth? But, but, I but, think that's but, all it is. And I think that's all the Tory party has been for a long... I'm not a Tory supporter, as you might tell. <laughs> yeah, you might but, be. You might be a supporter of the kind of Ken Clark, Rory Stewart, uh, Dominic Grieve b- b- brand of conservatism, but that's utterly alien to what Liz Truss seems to represent I, these days. I think a good idea is a good idea regardless who came up with it. Yeah, nicely so put. I'm not, I'm not blinded by my politics, but th- this isn't politics. What the Tories are doing at the moment, Liz Truss, Cammy Badenoch, um, Suella Bradman, it's, it's, it's disgusting. It's grotesque. And the question of whether they believe it or not is moot, really, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter whether they believe it or not. They're appealing to people who will or who do or who pretend to in order to, you know, sanitise their racism, sanitise their Islamophobia, sanitise their anti-Semitism, whatever it may be. You've got a former British Prime Minister sharing platforms with a man calling for the abolition of democracy through violence and saying that we didn't go far enough on January the 6th. You've got a former British Prime Minister standing in front of a room full of people who think that Joe Biden, who who claim that Joe Biden didn't win the last American election, claiming that the left in the United Kingdom didn't accept the result of the 2019 election. How mad does it have to be before you ignore it? Or, I mean, that is a killer question, isn't it, that Phil touched upon there. It's the same question. You could say, how mad does it have to be before you ignore it completely? Or how mad does it have to be before you pay attention? It's the same question, isn't it? I don't know the answer. Rob's in chairing in Kent. Rob, what would you like to say? Um, I wanted to sort of draw an analogy that might explain um, her mental condition. Okay, be careful. Um, We're neither of us qualified to diagnose anybody. No, no, well, no, I'm no. not. You it's, might be. This isn't uh, sort of medical. Okay, um, good, good. Just to be, just to be sure. <laughs> Diagnosis. Yeah, I'm not qualified for that for sure. Right. Um, but um, uh, the analogy I draw is with the fundamentalist evangelical Christians in the Bible Belt of America, who have the same tunnel vision that ignores the scholarship of um, yeah. experts. Yeah. And uh, uh, regardless of the fact that those experts have a reputation and a career to well, this um, is the this is the fossils were put there by God to challenge us kind of school of thought, isn't it? There were no dinosaurs, yeah. and the fossils aren't real. The, you, you, the, the, it's just tests from God to challenge our faith. That kind of incredible cultish subscription. Yeah, and I say that that sort of intense um, tunnel vision. Um, it affects them and affects Liz Truss. And it is dangerous. I think she's dangerous and we shouldn't ignore her because we really ignored that with Mrs Thatcher. Um, I expect there's going to be a James O'Brien law before long that we mustn't draw analogies. With Margaret Thatcher. With... Well, oddly, I think she'd be turning in her grave at what Liz Truss has been saying in America. I really do. Oh, I yeah. Don't, I, I don't know that yeah. that's a fair analogy. Well, it's not an analogy anyway. It is. Because, I mean, because um, Margaret Thatcher was um, more intelligent and so on, which is um, really why her I've got ideas furniture that's appeared. more intelligent than Liz Truss. Uh, oh, yeah, more, definitely. I really do. She's turned yeah. into that Hopkins woman, hasn't she, really? She just seems to say anything yeah. for a 
for a speaker's check, but she was Prime Minister a couple of years ago. That's the bit I can't I know, quite get my head around. Uh, which is embarrassing to us, as, as Trump is embarrassing to the right-thinking people in America. So, however, the more ridiculous it gets, the more attention we should pay, because history has taught us that ri- the line between ridiculous and dangerous can be perilously thin. That's it, and then you get Trump. And then, you get, and then you get Trump, who is both ridiculous and dangerous. Do you know, I thank you, Rob. I finished the chapter for the paperback last night, finally, and then I woke up this morning and thought, there's at least three more things I should really put in it. But I talk about the line between awfulness and uselessness in a little couple of paragraphs about 30p Lee. But that's a much more powerful phrase, isn't it? The line between ridiculous and dangerous. Hitler was ridiculous for years. I can't, I, no one can sit there genuinely thinking that Truss is going to sort of... Until you see the kind of people that she's sharing a platform with, one of whom literally called for the abolition of democracy and its replacement with a theocracy, which leads directly into Rob's parallel with... Evangelical so-called Christians. Half past 11 is the time. Thomas Watts is here with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 26 minutes to 12. Dear James writes, Nell, Truss is very dangerous. She's on a mission and she's got very powerful people behind her, manipulating her and pushing her forward. Um, Possibly even more worrying is Farage, who is more likely than Truss now to achieve political power in the UK. Neither should be ignored. Um, And that question of manipulation uh, is is fascinating. So one of the other things at this so-called CPAC conference uh, is that they have the phrase where globalism comes to die. That's um, the, the, the slogan under which they speak. And yet Truss was in favour of staying in the European Union, crucially, she also um, falls through those zero tariff trade deals with New Zealand and Aus- Australia, which, you know, that's the definition of, of, of globalism. It's just, it's frankly bizarre that she... Well, here's the thing I used to believe. I used to look at history and think the difference between ridiculous and dangerous is that the dangerous people believe it, even when they look ridiculous. And the ridiculous people are doing it for clicks and giggles money and status and therefore they can't quite deliver when push comes to shove you know i think that's god that was close keith rollox i think that's rollox i think i was completely it's like self it's it's a self comforting position to take how many despots actually believed whatever it was they were peddling you know i think there's a there's a there's a strand of scholarship that shows hitler could easily have persecuted Muslims instead of Jews as a sort of historical so he just needed somebody to persecute uh, in the same way that Suella Braverman um, has decided that the way for her to bolster her political position at the moment is to try to persecute Muslims uh, that, 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 that belief that deep belief in something probably is not what distinguishes the ridiculous from the dangerous the line between ridiculous and dangerous is, is either non-existent or perforated so how dangerous is Liz Truss? And what what has happened to her in the space of eight years? And I would not be talking about her if she hadn't been Prime Minister, all right? We don't do entire phone-ins on Nigel Farage's decision to go and hang out with massive racists and uh, and, and, uh, election deniers and, and, and truthers. But she's a former Prime Minister. She has to matter more by all, all available definitions. What the heck has happened to her? It is 11.37. Mo's in Birmingham. Mo, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Thank you for taking my call. You're very welcome. Um, James, I don't worry about Liz Truss herself. How much of this had you heard before? How much of this had you seen? Um, I've I've, I've seen a lot of it. Have you? Uh, Okay, good. And I'll tell you why I'm not worried about Liz Truss, but I worry about the message that she is espousing. For one, I think she's a hopeless speaker. Yeah. You cannot take her seriously at all. Yeah, that's a really good and so point. She is so the same she, words, she, the same words being delivered by an effective demagogue would be a lot more chilling. Yes. Yes. And we we're in a political environment where, you know, a lot of people are disengaged, a lot of people are looking for reasons why their stock isn't good. Yeah. And if there was somebody who can knit a message encompassing some of what Liz Truss says and some of what there, I say what Suella Braverman has said in a in a in an op-ed today in the Telegraph. Then there is a problem, but Liz Truss herself not. And I think the other reason why you can't take Liz Truss seriously here 
is that there are so many contradictions in the message he espouses. If you could convince me, James, that there is a communist cabal that runs the international bond markets, yeah. then you could sell me anything. You could sell... Now that's what she's essentially anything. trying to do. <laughs> no, yeah, no one... <laughs> The, 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 the markets that. that did for her were actually closet, secret, trans activists, communists. I, I mean, it, I, but this is where, yeah, I think you're just right, aren't you? So what she's saying is absolutely dangerous, but because it's her that's saying it, it doesn't achieve the salience, even if she is a former British Prime Minister. That's the only reason why she's there. She's a rubbish yeah. speaker and she's clearly crackers, but she's a former British Prime Minister. So she is being paid presumably a ton of money to get out her paint pot full of credibility earned exclusively by having become Prime Minister under ludicrous circumstances and performing abominably. But nevertheless, there is credibility of a kind in that pot, the kind of credibility that Farage is, is, is never going to have. And she can then dip her brush in that pot and just paint some credibility over proceedings, even as she denigrates the United Kingdom, even as she makes her, makes makes us, or not us, but but the word laughing stock is somewhere in the next sentence that I want to say, but I don't know exactly where it fits. Mm. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, and as I said, I, I worry, I worry that there is someone out there, and I'm sure there is, who could, you know, be adopted by the Tories or by a, a major party, use its mechanics, and then Cherry picks these ideas. He's fresh or she is fresh. They're able to speak properly. They're able to project without having all that baggage of nonsense that Liz Truss has. And that is, that is the fear that I have. And our democratic politicians, they're in Parliament out there. And if, 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 she, the was, if she was that. a really good speaker, Farage probably wouldn't be sitting next to her, would he? Because it would uh, run the risk of drawing some attention away from him, who is a, is a, is a competent speaker, although not a brilliant one. Yes. I think you might be onto something there. But I, I, I still, you're in a minority. Most people saying we, we should be worried. Oddly enough, I spoke to another American politician this week who couldn't sit further away from the Cracker Jacks and bigots that Liz Truss has been knocking around with this week. Um, Bernie Sanders, who people probably don't fully appreciate, came devilishly close to achieving the Democrat nomination um, when he challenged Hillary Clinton for it. I think it was 54-46, so not quite the infernal ratio of 52-48, but he did that from a standing start in 2016. He, he did that um, essentially um, on, on small donations. I, I, barely anything went into his pot that was more than $200. It was all from people. He got, That's your silent majority right there. And it was one of the most interesting interviews I think I've ever done, albeit that it was, for fans of full disclosure, much shorter than usual. Today in America, the wealthiest and the world, the oligarchs, the wealthiest people in the world, have never ever had it so good. Mm. Right. So when everybody hear it, if you are having trouble paying rent or affording food or the basic necessities, the people on top today, that class of people have never ever had it so good. Today, in America, you have three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of American society. You got that? Mm. Three people on one side, 160 million people on the other side. So that's Buffett, Gates, and Bezos. You got it. No, it's not Buffett. No, it's, Gates, uh, Bezos, and Musk. Um, the oh, Musk, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Be uh, uh, Bezos, uh, the, the, the Buffett gives it away. Yeah, he's, well. Up to a point, Lord. Don't Robert. stay up nights worrying about it. That's another sure. story. Uh, but but they're, they're embarked upon a mission of constant accruement. That's that, right. That there is never enough. That's exactly the point. That's what the book is about. Yeah. And worldwide, you have the top 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 99%. So here we are in the year 2024, 250 years after maybe the, the, the beginning of modern democracy. That's where we are. Top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 99%. So the question is that you asked, you know, why don't we learn more about it? There are 100 different ways that the people who own, that the ruling class wants to maintain their position of power. Sometimes they have to use military force, mm. but that's ugly. Uh, but what you do is you hide truth from ordinary working people. So instead of talking about the greed of the ruling class, we'll talk about what immigrants do. We'll talk about uh, the threat, quote unquote, threat of the gay lifestyle or whatever it may be. Uh, but there is a very consistent pattern of trying to deny class consciousness. For example, yeah. right now in America, 60% of 
of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Is that phrase that you understand? Yes, of course. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. If you listen to television in America, you watch TV, the word working class will never, ever be used. There is no class in America. There is no working class. Okay? And that's not an accident. We are a classless society with three people owning more wealth than the bottom half. Uh, but we don't even want to talk about class. Uh, we don't want to talk about the history of class struggle. We don't want to talk about how working class people can come together and what a new vision for society would look like. Partly because of the of the myth of the American dream, the myth of aspiration. There's that Steinbeck line, isn't there, about there being no such thing as poverty in Dust Bowl era America, just temporarily frustrated millionaires. <laughs> that's, but that's one of the best lines ever written about yeah, what it, you're describing. But it's, it's, look, it is, if you watch television, it, it is, it's, yeah. It could be you. <laughs> yeah, it could be you. That's one of the myths out there. That's true. But bottom line is the ruling class wants to maintain a status quo which works very well for them. And, you know, whether it is media, you know, we talked about media, whether it is politics. Right now, I don't know how many of your uh, listeners will know this. In America's very, very corrupt political system, we are a quote-unquote democracy, right? Yeah. We have the right to vote every sure. two years. Now, Republicans are trying to make it harder. That's true. But what's even more significant is if you are a billionaire in the United States of America today, you can set up what is called a super PAC, super political action committee. Do you know what that super PAC can do, James? Oh uh, yeah, I do. Well, All right, do. you can put hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars mm. into that to run TV ads or organize the whatever you want to defeat candidates who stand for working people and support your reactionary friends. That's what the American political system has evolved into. So. What the book deals about is the power. It's not just the immorality of income and wealth inequality, which is horrendous. It is what power is about. Power is ownership of the media. It determines what we consider to be important or not. Power is political control. And I, I, I mean, the idea that Bernie Sanders can exist in the same political space as Donald Trump is... I suppose it's democracy in action, isn't it? Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of thought. But then Liz Truss, a former British prime minister, when offered the opportunity to decide which way to go, goes towards Donald Trump. I, 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 I breath it. It's an amazing interview. I can't say that, can I? I conducted it. He's an amazing man. And it is an opportunity to get to, to know a little bit more about him. Do you know, he's the same age as Joe Biden. Um, I, and I wish he was standing. I wish he was running for U.S. president this year. I really do. The, the man's just got it. He's got he's got a quick silver brain. He's not perfect. Uh, I know Emily sat down with him as well on the News Agents podcast. I don't know if that's gone out yet. Uh, there's a couple of moments in there that are pretty magical as well. Like he goes, "Welcome to my world." Uh, you know, he is. A lot of you think oh, he sounds a bit like Larry Sanders. They're actually distant cousins. Larry Sanders from Curb Your Enthusiasm. They, they did a thing together because they look quite similar and they sound quite similar. They're from a similar background in New York. And it, someone dug into the family trees. It turns out they're really, really distant cousins. And in fact, he's got a brother who I think has phoned the show a couple of times who's a Green Party politician in Oxfordshire who is called Larry Sanders. Why am I telling you all this? This is utterly irrelevant to the point of this little clip, which is download full disclosure. Get it from the Global Player app um uh, it, it, it's a lovely lovely encounter where after about five minutes i just folded my notes up and and, and sat on them and just thought i'm just going to chat to this guy and and i'm so privileged that i got the opportunity to do so and i'm so glad that you can listen to it it's 11 46 james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc it is 10 to 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Some uh, some quite sad news for you before we uh, catch up with Lewis Goodall and his latest scoop. The actor John Savadon, I can tell you, has passed away at the age of 86 years old. You'll know him um, as Fred Elliott from Coronation Street, one of those screen presences that was absolutely mesmeric. And I, I think speaking to quite an old tradition, Almost a music hall tradition um, that, that that he represented. I, I loved. I, I thought it was superb in Coronation Street. I really did. And um, uh, his agent has announced that he's passed away at the age of eighty-six. Eleven fifty-one is the time. 
Lewis Goodall, uh, star of LBC and the news agent, has been having a look at Sir Paul Marshall. It's an investigation that has been conducted in conjunction with Hope Not Hate. And if you don't know who Paul Marshall is, you certainly will be familiar with some of his... Uh, some of his work and ambitions. He owns half of GB News. He's trying to buy the Telegraph and the Spectator. He set up a website called Unheard um, and is therefore one of this new breed of plutocrat who seems very keen to use their money to secure and and peddle influence, even when it is not necessarily commercially viable. I believe GBBs is losing about £30 million a year, but they're clearly getting something which they think is worth the money. And they seek to do this, to, to influence public opinion, while not really adopting much of a public persona themselves. There's another one called Jeremy Hosking, who bankrolls the lad from Lewis, who wasn't Lewis. And I, I'm increasingly intrigued by them, as indeed is Lewis, who has been having a look at a, a Twitter account that was, I don't know what the correct terminology is, Lewis. Is it locked or private? What's the correct terminology? And what did you find? So, James, it's, it, he put it to a private, as you say, it's concerned to Paul uh, Marshall. Um, and he had his uh, Twitter account was public before that, had about 5,000 followers. In September 2023, he set his Twitter account to protected mode or private mode, which meant that only his 5,000 followers, which include, you know, lots of well-known journalists, cabinet ministers and so on, because this is a man, as you were alluding to, who is in so many ways at the heart of the British establishment and the British sort of centre-right establishment in particular and the Conservative Party. In September 2023, he changed it and he removed any reference to his name and he uh, gave it a, a name which was instead named after one of his businesses, something that couldn't easily be identified with him. And at about that time, it seems that the content became more extreme so he doesn't and never really did tweet much himself he would just like and retweet accounts of others but some of the accounts and that he was interacting with are by any stretch of the imagination radical right or in some cases actually far right we're talking about you know the britain uh, uh, britain first deputy leader ashley simon american anti-muslim pro-trump uh, campaigners someone like amy meck for example and and they are uh, tweets which as i say i mean you know people should prepare themselves for this but they say things like it is a matter of time before the civil war starts in europe the native european population is losing impatience with fake refugee invaders one from january 2024 which the poor liked if we want european civilization to survive we need to not just close the borders but start mass expulsions immediately we don't stand a chance until we start very soon this theme that Muslims can't live in European societies without there being some sort of violence. Very, very common. So another one saying civil war is coming. There has never been a country that has remained peaceful with a sizable Islamic presence. And then other tweets which lay out literally the so-called four stages of Islamic infiltration, which will culminate in a the establishment of a theocratic Islamic state. And as I say, these aren't his tweets. He's just liking and retweeting them. But the fact that someone who is at that level of seniority, both in the sort of British political establishment, British media as well, could be interacting with those sorts of accounts and on some level giving an endorsement to them because he's retweeting and liking them does show, I think, how normalised some of these ideas have become. Well, I suppose there's one easy way to find out. Are, are there any tweets liking or, or, or retweeting the opposite positions, positions that, that you know, tra trumpet the basic equality of human beings or, or push back against the tri the attempts to conflate Islamist, is, Islamist extremism with, 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 with mere religious observant on, on, on the part of, of Muslims. Me, for example, Lewis. And has he retweeted me at all? We, I didn't notice any of your tweets. Well, anybody, say, anybody who could be portrayed as being opposed to the kind of Islamophobic uh, and, and uh, on occasion, oh. far-right rhetoric that you've just described. Well, I mean, one thing that's happened to the tweets now is that they've, funnily enough, disappeared. Well, all of we them. Yes. When we approached the Paul about... The, this matter earlier in the week, we noticed alongside Hope uh, Not Hate, we noticed that the uh, tweets were st were deleted or removed from his account. And he obviously got back to it, funnily enough, he hmm. got back to us later in the week and he told us this, Paul Marshall's account, this is his representatives, Paul Marshall's account is private, but is nonetheless followed by 5,000 people, including many journalists. He posts on a wide variety of subjects and those cited represent a small and unrepresentative sample 
of over 5,000 posts. This sample does not represent his views. As most X or Twitter users know, it can be a fountain of ideas, mm. but some of it is of uncertain quality, and all his posts have now been deleted to avoid further misunderstanding. So, uh, yeah, to avoid any... Uh, what he's essentially saying is to avoid any um, implication. Yes. I agree. Lest you, lest you read it uh, and misunderstand it. Yes. While yes. reading it. For example, yes, what, what, I mean, you... what fake refugee invaders and native Europeans, you might misunderstand what is meant by those words, for example. Well, you might, well, of course, you might say that the best way to avoid the misunderstanding that one might agree with a view like that is not to retweet or like the things in the first place. But there you go. That, that might just be an, an unfair critique on our part. Who knows, James? It, it, I find myself prefacing a lot of questions I ask at the moment with, with the following. It, if we lived in normal times in a normal country with, with normal politicians in power, would this compromise his ambitions to own the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator? I, I mean, there used to be a quite enforced law, although it all changed really when Rupert Murdoch went to checkers to see Margaret Thatcher uh, before trying to buy the Times and then promptly forgot about it until cabinet papers were released decades later. But there used to be a fit and proper test, didn't there, for people to own national newspapers or major media outlets? Well, I think there is a, a big question about whether uh, Sir Paul Marshall's result of this is is an appropriate figure to own something like the Telegraph, which is an extremely important newspaper. Well, anyway, it fit right in at the Spectator, or at least some of the tweets that he has sent out would be practically columns, wouldn't they? At Andrew Neil's a Spectator. Well, I think you know what. It doesn't surprise me, James, but I still find it shocking in, in one yeah. sense, which is that we put this story out yesterday. Yes, it's got a lot of traction on social media and so on, but where are where is the commentary or or crit criticism? of this from all of the people who are lamenting the rise of extremism, rightly in some ways, over the past 24 hours. We've had a 24 hours where we've had lots of very senior political figures, especially on the right, mm. attacking so-called, attacking extremism and the rise of extremism in our culture. That's fine. But then you've got to attack extremism wherever you see it. And by any stretch of the imagination, the, this content is extreme. And, you know, all, I mean, if you think about a, a comparison, I mean, do you remember there was a great deal of controversy from lots of newspapers when it was revealed that the Labour Party had accepted a donation from a man who'd given some money to Extinction Rebellion. Mm. Now you can have an argument about whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing. But look at the complete disparity in attention that something like that will receive as opposed to this, which, as I say, I'm, something I'm, I'm struck by is also, and I find disturbing, is the number of people who are, you know, pom life on social media in the grand scheme of things. But on the other hand, they are important in planting seeds in the kind of ecosystem of ideas, right? And they come back to you and they say, what's wrong with what he's saying? What's wrong with what he's saying? This is just normal. Millions of people think this. No, they don't. You think they do. But you are, what is happening, this is all part of the process as you've talked about many times, of the normalization of some very extreme political ideas that we should be very wary about. Um, I presume Andrew Neil's going to have a lot to say about it because he's been very vocal on the unsuitability of another bidder for the Telegraph and, and the Spectator. Have you seen any response from him yet to this? From this him, story? I haven't, James. No, not I'm yet. Sure he's probably we, we busy. Wait. though. He's just having a big breakfast. He'll, he'll be he'll be all over it by tea time. I guarantee. Well, I think mean, there's another question as well, of course, for the say the Conservative Party. I mean, Sir Paul Marshall has donated half a million pounds to the Conservative Party. Would yeah. the Conservative Party want to accept money? Feel comfortable accepting money from him again in the future? GB News is a of people who appear on GB News, or will they be comfortable about this? You know, but the thing is, these questions increasingly you can put them, but I suspect no one will answer them, which tells its own story. And and it's very very difficult for journalists like you, and to to a lesser extent me, to find ways of of, of holding feet to the fire if they just completely ignore the questions and indeed the investigations. Uh, Lewis Goodall back with you later, of course, this evening on LBC, and uh, and also one of the news agents, uh, part of that um, uh, market leading podcast. Um, Six p.m. this evening, Lewis will be with you, which is why he was down the line today rather than in the studio. He can't he can't he has to go home at some point. In the week, it, it's just gone twelve. Um, I, I, we've got to catch up with more of our Ukraine guests in in the next hour. I think, given that conversation there, as well, a, a, a little return to this the, the the conundrum that Liz Truss poses over whether or not crazy extremism should be ignored, even if it's a former UK Prime Minister, or whether or not the danger should be properly registered. In which case, how do you properly register the danger? 12.01 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 
It was Larry David, of course, not Larry Flipping Sanders. Thank you to the 764 million people who have um, uh, uh, pointed that out. Here's an interesting one. James has been in touch. As I'm listening from central Queensland, was that clip you played out real? Well, every clip we've played out was real, but I'm wondering which one you're thinking of. I presume it was a Liz Truss clip that you were thinking of. Jacob Rees-Mogg said something this week that I was going to clip up and, and play out as a joke. I was going to go, I can't believe what they've used AI to do now. And then I was going to play an actual clip of Jacob Rees-Mogg saying something about milk. And then I was going to interrupt it hilariously and go, oh, I beg your pardon, that's not AI at all. That is actually Jacob Rees-Mogg saying something ridiculous about milk. So I don't know, James, which clip you're referring to, but we don't play out fake clips on this programme unless we couch them, or I don't think we ever have, but if we did, we would couch them immediately with lots and lots of signposts saying fake clips. I've had enough of trust for now. I, I, I have not satisfactorily answered the question of whether or not we are going to ignore her in the future. I, I, I'm, de I'm depressed, in fact, by the proof, if you like, of, of all of my worst fears about the direction of traffic, enforced really by, by Lewis Goodall's report there on Paul Marshall, one of the owners of GB News, um, routinely retweeting and liking some truly toxic and Islamophobic content on his private Twitter account. Uh, th these things are not happening in isolation and they are not happening by accident. So Ella Braverman in The Telegraph today trying desperately to conflate Islamist extremism with, with ordinary Muslims, just as the kind of people that she um, uh, uh, knocks about with have been doing for years, They're just desperate to, to pretend that extremists represent everybody because that's the only way you can really get enough traction for... Uh, a form of, of, of well, I suppose, a form of race war is what you're ultimately agitating for. Um, and there it is, all singing, if you like, from the same hymn sheet. But let's let's go at it from a different angle. You, you've heard that Shamima Begum's citizenship or, or her attempt to overturn a ruling last year that the revocation of her citizenship was lawful has failed. I, I, the, the, I, this is a weird one, I find. And I'll tell you why, because I could say to you now, I don't think this is a black and white issue. And you'd immediately jump to one of two conclusions. You would either uh, conclude that we are trying far too hard to be liberal and nice about someone who doesn't deserve. It would be like Karl Popper's, um, what's it, a thing of me of tolerance, you know, what's it called? The thing of tolerance, Karl Popper's something of tolerance. Where, where you eventually, your tolerance leads to too much intolerance, to tolerate the intolerance. It's a really clever little philosophical gambit that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have needed. The paradox of tolerance, perhaps. I wouldn't have needed your help in remembering that a few years ago, but we're all getting out. None of us are getting any younger. Or you, you'd think, if I said, I don't think it's a black and white issue, you'd think immediately, oh, you think she doesn't have any rights. You think she should be treated differently from a white 15-year-old girl. And the answer to both of those questions is get lost. Because here is why I struggle to see this quite as clearly as some people do, right? The decision to run away and join ISIS can, in the first moment of analysis, be about as close as it's possible for me to get to ever endorsing a death penalty. And then you introduce the fact that she was 15 years old when it happened. And I think, well, I don't think anybody anywhere should really be in favour of capital punishment for children. I, I mean, I'm passionately opposed to capital punishment per se for reasons probably best expressed when Ian Hislop had the misfortune of finding himself on Question Time with um, a conservative politician who was in favour of it. I actually forget which one would you believe. It might have been Truss, could have been Braverman. I don't, I'm pretty sure it was a woman. Um, so that, that's, that's the end of that. But, but running away to join ISIS, I don't know how much you know about ISIS, but the medieval barbarism that was deployed by them was obviously off the charts. So anybody drawn towards it instead of repulsed by it is as close to being beneath contempt as it is possible for me personally to get, right? I read a lot about 16th, 17th century Britain. It's a, it's a period I find absolutely fascinating. And if, if you think it's, it's unique to certain ethnicities or religions, that level of medieval barbarism, you need to give your head a wobble. You really do. There, there is, um, a, a, you know, just a few generations ago, we were engaging in all sorts of uh, comparable behaviour, torturing people until they confessed 
to things that they'd never done. I just have a little look at, at, at what people like Robert Cecil would get up to or um, or Thomas Walsingham. I, just, I mean, it is, frankly, incredible how hard some people find it to understand that barbarism is a human trait. It's not a, uh, a trait unique to any star sign, ethnicity or religion. But at this, it was pretty Patel, I've been told by 364,000 people who uh, Ian Hislop had to educate upon the issue of capital punishment. My apologies to Suella Bravman and Liz Truss. Uh, I, I, I mean that. It's, 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 it's unthinkable what ISIS represent. But then I remember the grooming gangs that were not... I remember when I first started reporting on the grooming gangs, particularly in the north and the midlands of England on this programme, and this would be back in about 2010, long before little Tommy Ten Name started claiming that nobody was reporting it. I remember when we first started reporting on the issue of, of, of grooming gangs that were comprised of, in those cases, largely Pakistani men, men of Pakistani origin, and looking into the reasons why the authorities, the social services, the police had not properly investigated or prosecuted or pursued these culprits. The reason that was given time and time and time again was that they, the, the teenage girls concerned were complicit in their own abuse, that they were consenting teenagers even as they were legally incapable of giving consent so the police would say well you can't prosecute a bloke for having a relationship with a girl who wants to have a relationship with that bloke it is statutory rape for sexual relations to occur with a child under 16 even if the other person engaging in sexual relations is under 16 it's statutory rape but the 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 thing that turned my stomach most actually about the whole of that saga and still does was the the failure of police to protect children because quite often they came from dysfunctional backgrounds they had reputations for being troublemakers but crucially the point upon which much of it fell was the idea that they were consenting despite the fact that the law said that they couldn't. And that is the only point where I wonder whether Shamima Begum has been treated either unfairly or differently from how somebody from a different background might have been treated. Because you and I are today in 2024 disgusted by what we discovered in 2010 about why 15, 14 year old girls were not having their abuse properly investigated or prosecuted by grown men because there was a sense that despite the fact that the law says it's not possible, they were actually giving their consent to their abusers. I, I have the most obvious trope is that a lot of them thought that their abuser was their boyfriend. And that's the only point where I think that this is actually worth a conversation. Just that there. Uh, with one extra dimension that, again, I think we, we talked about on this programme before the rest of the media caught up with it, uh, largely because the author, the journalist that made the discovery, um, came here first. And that was the Canadian intelligence services having information that, the, that, Be that, that Begum and her fellow absconders, or whatever you want to call them, fellow ISIS brides, had been trafficked, if you like. There'd been a process of seduction conducted online to the point where they, quotes, willingly, end quotes, were making their way to Syria to join ISIS, but they were not making that journey unaided. And the process of helping them get there would, under most legal definitions, fall under the category of sex trafficking. So another human being in, exact, in, in similar circumstances would either have been rendered a victim by consequence of their age, a victim of statutory rape by consequence of their age, or a victim of sex trafficking by consequence of the process by which they ended up in the hands of their abusers. Do you see? But neither of those apply to her. 
neither of those apply to her. And I don't fully understand why. Do you? 03456060973. There are hundreds of, of, of schoolgirls in places like Rochdale whose abusers got away scot-free for years because the police thought that a 14, 15-year-old girl could consent to a sexual relationship with an adult man. And yet those men, thankfully now, face persecution and prosecution. And a 15-year-old girl is not legally capable of doing... So Jack's been in touch. I wonder if it's the same Jack who was asking earlier what the far right was. He says she went willingly. Jack, pay attention, mate. That's what they said about the victims of trafficking in Rochdale. And when you pretend to care about them because the abusers were brown-skinned, you're, you're always going on about how terrible it was, mate. So you can't say they went willingly, as in Shamima Begum and her mates, and that the victims of sexual abuse and trafficking in, in, in the north of England didn't go willingly. It's exactly the same thing. They thought they were doing it willingly, but the law says you can't because you're 15. I can't believe I have to explain this stuff to you. Um... Eleanor's been in touch as well. She says, this is such a leap. Are you comparing having sex with joining ISIS? No, I'm comparing being raped by a taxi driver in Rochdale with being raped by an ISIS soldier in Syria, Eleanor. What is it you don't understand about that? And in both circumstances, even if the girl said that she was uh, happy with the arrangement, it would still be rape because she would only be 15. I can hear brains struggling to actually understand this point because tabloid reporting actively encourages you not to think about things. So I'll say it again. Running away to join ISIS is, for me, the closest you get in this country to being eligible for capital punishment. And I row back furiously from that position when you tell me that the person who ran away is 15. Why? Well, because there is an age of criminal responsibility. And whatever you have done, if you are below that age, the idea that you would be hanged for it, as you would have been in um, uh, uh, previous centuries in this country, you could have been hanged for stealing a loaf of bread, is, is to me disgusting. It's ridiculous. And then I bring in the victims of trafficking and sexual abuse by so-called grooming gangs. And, and the reason I'm focusing on them, despite the fact that, that, that paedophilia and child sex abuse is much, much, much more likely to be committed by people of my ethnicity than anybody else's, simply by terms of numbers and, and demographics, that particular crime, that failure to protect victims, that failure to prosecute perpetrators, was built upon the fact that adults looked at 14 and 15-year-old girls being sexually abused and decided that it wasn't actually a crime or it wasn't something worth pursuing because the girls actively wanted it, which is exactly what Jack has just said about Shamima Begum, literally using the same language. They went willingly. It's what the police said. She willingly got into his car. She willingly went away with him. She ran away from home to be with her abuser. So how can I prosecute the abuser when she has run into his arms? So here's the question. What's the difference? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. What's the difference? I, I genuinely can't see it at the moment, but I, I presume there is one because I generally trust the decisions that are handed down by courts. So what is the difference between a policeman saying we're not going to invest the rape of this 15-year-old because she got into her rapist's car willingly and thinks that she's in a meaningful relationship with him What's the difference between saying that and saying, well, this 15-year-old can't possibly have her citizenship revoked because she was 15 when she ran into the arms of her abusers? What's the difference? 0345 6060973. It's 12.18. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 22 minutes after 12 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Well, the question's pretty simple. One of the reasons why the failure to prosecute... Grooming gangs in the north of England for so long uh, occurred was because authorities felt that 15-year-old girls could consent to their own abuse. Um, so how come the 15-year-old Shamima Begum keeps getting told she is responsible for her own fate? That's that's the only question. What's the difference? Emily's in Leon C. Emily, what do you think? Hi, hi, James. Um, I've got a really controversial um, opinion on this, and it's the first time I've really spoken out Go on. Um, because every time I've mentioned it i just get shouted down okay um and by whom every... who have you been mentioning it to 
if I've mentioned something on, you know, Facebook, I don't really okay. post on Facebook about things anymore, but um, it, I just get even people on sort of the left of politics. Yeah, go on, know, just t- t- um, tell me what it is, because we're short of time. Sorry, um, I just think she's been used, Shimema has been used as a scapegoat um, to, um, it's, it's a convenient way of justifying um, the, you know, our wider war on on prosecuting terrorists and invading other countries. Basically. Really? Um, I'm probably not making too much sense, but... Um, with, with respect, it, it, you're not. It, no, sorry, I'm just really <laughs> nervous. That's all right. Take, well, take, take a bit been, of time. She's been treated really, really unfairly. Um, she was a child, basically, when she went to Syria. I do think she was exploited and groomed. Um, and... Why has she not received the same protections other children would? Yeah, that's the point, isn't it? Because, I, I mean, I, I nearly, I bit my tongue then to push straight back at you and say she really, really, <laughs> really wanted to go. But then I turn into one of the police officers in Rotherham that, that I've been attacking and criticising for the last 10 minutes. It's mm. What's the difference then in you? I don't, I don't think it's used as a way of prosecuting wars. I mean, you know, the, 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 we should have gone in harder, faster and sooner against ISIS. It would have saved the world a whole mm. heap of trouble. And but by contrast, if we hadn't gone into Iraq in the way that we we did then ISIS arguably never would have existed so I don't want to go down that road but I want you to tell me what you think the difference is between a, between a 15 year old who can't be held responsible for her for her own actions uh, or, or can't consent to a sexual relationship with an adult when she's um, in Rochdale and a 15 year old who apparently can consent to a relationship when she's in Syria both British both English well I think <clears throat> as I was not explaining very well before. I think the difference is um, is the is the perception and the public anger against the um, against ISIS, um, and I think that I'm probably still not going to explain no, this. No, that works. Well, no, that works because everyone's so furious about ISIS. It, it, she becomes a proxy, albeit that she wanted to join them. She becomes a proxy for our impotence and our fury in the face of this hideous medieval threat you could be i mean there's something in that but i don't think the courts go there that's that's the other problem is that the courts would look at all of the facts and take a sober view goodness knows how many right-wing people particularly very right-wing people are furious with decisions of courts i know that they're furious with everybody and everything but they fu- get furious when courts impose well you heard liz trust talking about it earlier here is a lawyer doing the law that's outrageous i don't like the verdict well that's it's the law that you don't like you know the job of the judge is simply to interpret the law and so I can't just be it can't be that because it keeps happening in court after court after court and the judges are no I mean they're fallible they are imperfect but they're categorically not in the business of, of blowing in the wind thank you Emily Beverly's in Kensal Green Beverly what would you like to say hey, okay hi Jane Hello. Um, this is my first time calling nice to speak to you likewise what do you so, reckon y- yeah you said you said something you said what is the difference yeah. Why? And my from my frame of reference, the way that I view it, I look at it as number one. She was fifteen years old. Yeah. She was a child. Okay. There's grooming there, safeguarding concerns. Where were school parents, um, social services? Where were the services um, in place to prevent this sort of thing from happening? Also, what was going on in her background? How was she socialised into believing that this is something that she wanted to do, that she's gone to the extent of actually we, doing We normally it. get cross with the people doing the radicalising, don't we, when it's children involved, as opposed to the radicalised, and that changes according to the age of the radicalised. But, uh, look, it, it, OK, she was a child. Yes. And we, you're condemning, or she has, she's continually being condemned for the mistakes that she made as a child. And uh, for me... That's the reason why she... I don't know why... Why do they keep rejecting her application? They don't want her here? Well, that's they the bit... They don't want her here because, that's because the bit she's that's Asian? Tricky. That's the bit that's tricky. Because you're saying, it, what's the difference? If this was a white girl in the same situation, wanted to come back to the UK to be prosecuted or whatever it is here, mm. why... That's the only difference that I see, is that she's not white. I mean, there is a woman, isn't there, who, who I forget what her nickname was, um, who was white, but she was a fully grown adult when she ran away to join ISIS and not, not a 15-year-old girl, which is, which is a child. I mean, technically, the, the, the definition is correct, albeit that we all know 15-year-olds who can be more uh, sophisticated, strong-willed and, and open-minded than, uh, than some of the 52-year-olds that, that we know. But that, that is the point. That's why I find it a very um, 
And she did something disgusting at an age when she couldn't be held responsible for what she did. And when she passed the age at which she could be held responsible for what she did, she carried on doing disgusting things. It's not like she turned around on her 16th birthday and ran back from Syria. But again, to use the parallel with the grooming gangs, the, the abuse that started when a girl was 14 or 15 and continued until they were in their early 20s didn't cease to be abuse once they passed the age of consent. So it is, you see what I meant about making your brain boil a bit. It's, I don't, th- I, and, and that's why there must be something before the court that we don't know about, Beverly. Uh, the national security question must be pertinent to this, and yet so much of the coverage either doesn't mention it or, or glosses over it. There must be reasons why she, she can't come back, she can't have her citizenship given back, which, uh, which speak to her adulthood, her adult years. I presume, although who am I to... Uh, speculate on something as complex as this. Harriet's in Clapham. Harriet, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello, Harriet. Um, so my kind of perspective on this, and I thought when you used that or when you made the parallel to mm. what happened in Rotherham, I thought that was really apt and it, it reminded me of something I had read um, that was it, it was a study or a graduate paper at Georgetown University and it basically talked about a phenomenon that's called adultification and it was focusing on black girls yeah. but I think this can be applied to other girls of colour as well and it basically found that particularly kind of states and institutions but also people basically kind of perceive black girls to be more grown up more um, or less needing of nurturing I think they said. I think someone adult, pointed like, that, some, do you know, someone cited that research when that school girl got, got, got strip searched in her own school mm, do you remember yes, someone mentioned that yeah. that would have been a consequence perhaps of adultification yeah, exactly. And I think, um, as you said, like they were both, or in those both those situations, girls have been groomed, and that's definitely the case. And at the same time, you know, there must have been things that um, that she's done um, as an adult that probably were taken into account. Yeah. But I think definitely from my experience as a woman of colour, there is this: people do sometimes treat you as being kind of less innocent. Definitely when it comes to things of a sexual nature, they kind of assume that you are more sexualized sometimes. Um, And so I think viewing the two 15-year-old girls that have been groomed, I do think that that maybe that's come into play. But at the same time, I also think it probably was also consider uh, there's there's a lot of tensions um i think recently that have been stoked by the media and by kind of various politicians recently and i also think that kind of that's been more brought to the fore possibly so this idea that women of color or girls of color are maybe a bit more could be yeah well i mean there's a vacuum there where the space to answer this question is what why why does that uh, that cr- uh, criminal dereliction of duty in the in the north of England not apply here because you cannot give consent to, to to sexual relationships when you're 15. They are statutory rape, and yet when this girl was 15, she was apparently perfectly capable of entirely autonomous behaviour. Um, half past 12 is the time. Thank you, Harriet. And and the, part of the reason why we have, we've done half an hour on this, we may take one or two more calls. It depends on the timing, but is is because I think that there's the big roadblock is the uh, national security question that, that that the courts will be aware of, but we won't. I think I, I, I may need a bit of counsel on that, a bit of guidance. But I do want to turn your attention between now and one o'clock to at least two more guests with regard to the war in Ukraine, the second anniversary, of course, tomorrow of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that that phrase that Luke Harding used earlier has been haunting me a bit ever since, that phrase of Ukraine fatigue. If you couple the notion of Ukraine fatigue, of which I feel we may almost all be guilty, with the image of 10 shells uh, an hour being launched from Russian positions at Ukraine positions that are currently without any ammunition whatsoever, largely as a consequence of the roadblock in the American um, political system uh, with regard to aid. It's a brilliant point, actually, when Emily interviewed Bernie Sanders and, and talked about how the package actually, in, giving aid to Ukraine involves giving more aid to Israel. So there's a difficult tension there for a lot of people. And, and, and Bernie Sanders goes, welcome to my world, as if, yeah, exactly. Politics is complicated. I think on a day that we've been looking at Liz Truss, it's, it's easy to forget that politics is complicated when um, extremely simple people can rise to the highest office in the land. 12.32 is the time. Tim Humphrey has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 
twelve thirty six is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. At, at time, I, I mean, talk about a banal observation. I was about to say something like, "Time is really strange, isn't it?" I sound like I'm stoned. Well, I, I can categorically assure you that I'm not. But but sometimes it is difficult to grasp the the passage of time. How I mean, if you didn't know that tomorrow marked the second anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine, I wonder what you would have guessed at how long it had been how long it had been going on. I, I don't think many people would have got it exactly right. Some people may feel it's been going on for much longer. People in Ukraine, I imagine, feel as if it's been going on for much longer. And then people who haven't been paying attention possibly think it started more recently. But it is two years tomorrow, and and it is important to reflect upon what has happened, what is happening, and what is likely to happen next. To help us do that, we've, we've invited a, a few of our regular guests onto the program, guests who appear regularly to talk about matters Ukrainian, and Kira Rudik is one of them, uh, an MP in Ukraine, leader of the Holos party, and, and currently in Kyiv. Um, it's hard to know where to start, uh, Kira. Thank you. Thank you for your time. What, what would you like to see people in the UK and the US, people in, 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 in the rest of Europe, what would you like to see them talking about most loudly with regard to your country and, and its continuing war? Hello, James. Thank you so much for having me. I think we are at a time right now where we desperately need this switch of perception from helping Ukraine to fight to actually letting us win the war. And I'm saying letting because it implies so many things, starting from the weapons. And I think it's fair to say that if your country is not at war, then the best investment of your weapons is to give them to Ukraine so we can fight Russia. <laughs> and well, because like because otherwise, what would happen? Yes. You have seen Putin's interview, right? Uh, does anybody think that this man will stop at something? So. He will not stop unless he stopped. And this is what we intend to do. And this is what we have been doing actually pretty successfully. The second point is uh, in of letting Ukraine win is make the sanctions finally actually work. So we are uh, facing the second anniversary. And still, when we unwrap the remains of the missiles that hit our homes, we see the Western parts there. So it became a little bit more expensive for Russia and maybe a little bit logistically complicated, but it did not become impossible for them to, to produce weapons and missiles and, and everything. And plus trade with Iran and North Korea. You know, the, recently there has been a confirmation that the missile that hit uh, Bucha, actually near Bucha, it was North Korean missile. So we are at the situation, our world went there, where North Korea not only produces weapons, but exports them and supports other authoritarian regimes. And the third point, and we have been talking about it for so long, is let Putin finance our victory against him. We are talking about this $500 billion of Russian money that are being frozen uh, in democratic countries. And I will not be over-exaggerating, saying that if the U.S. elections will turn um, very differently, yeah. uh, then at some point this money that everybody holds on and thinks that it will be forever, this money may be returned to Russia, right? We know that the sanctions can be lifted. So the window of opportunity to do the right thing with um, with those money is actually like what, like half of a year. Well, I mean, for, for people who need subtitles, I, I, not not because of the way that you're speaking, but because you didn't mention Donald Trump by name. You're suggesting that if Donald Trump got back into the White House, he would very, very likely do Vladimir Putin's bidding up to and including returning the five hundred billion dollar. Um, $500 billion worth of frozen assets. Uh, Kira, you campaign on this. We've spoken about this before, and, and our mutual friend Bill Browder has been very active throughout uh, the, the campaign, calling for exactly the same thing. What reason are you given by our politicians, by British politicians or by American politicians, for not doing what seems obvious to so many? What reasons do they give you when they say, oh, I'm sorry, Kira, we can't do that because? Because... Uh, there are legal matters because it is politically inconvenient. Read, read in it whatever you want. Mm, mm. Because there would be elections coming up. Because there are so many good Russian people whose money are frozen and who are sponsors 
of different politicians and who uh, may turn their backs if uh, Russian money are being um, used for the sake of Ukraine, because uh, it will set a uh, quote unquote dangerous precedent. Yes. Uh, for the countries that uh, start the full-scale invasion. And I'm saying, well, yeah, well, this is what we actually want to do to, to establish this really dangerous precedent that if you start a full-scale invasion, commit all kinds of war crimes, then your money will be gone. Yes, this is exactly what we want to do. And I don't see any danger with it, other than for the other authoritarian regimes that really uh, are thinking about starting a war. Well, Yes, this is what West will do. And I think to show that the West means business, it's so important to go ahead with this matter. And actually, by the way, James, I don't think that we talked about this with you since it happened. Belgium has uh, actually done the first step. Yes. They have taken taxes. And it's not a small amount. It's 2 billion euros. And it uh, will go to Ukraine facility package um, within the next couple of months. So it is the first sign that, the you know, the first crack in the ice, mm. I call it. I like that phrase. It's a, it's a rather healthier precedent than the one that, that, um, that, that you were referring to previously. How serious is the imbalance now in, in armaments? How serious is the, the difference between the Russian capabilities and the Ukrainian capabilities? Well, it is serious. I unfortunately cannot tell you the numbers. Of course. But just imagine that Russia, Iran and North Korea are uh, having their military productions working 24 seven, and they have like uh, very small limitations of what they can do. And we have not received even a half of promised ammunition package from EU for the last year. The help and aid from the United States is blocked. Mm. And even if it's, it will be a miracle and it's voted like today, yes, it course. will still have like up to six months until we will start receiving it in a normal pace. And the West is not producing the weapons and missiles and ammunition in the speed that would compare to um, to the authoritarian regimes. And it is obvious, but it is so unpredictably um, dangerous for all of us. And, and is that because of where we started this conversation? Is, is it because of a failure to appreciate the... The, the, the threat to us rather than simply the threat to Ukraine. If, if the threat to other countries, most obviously, I suppose, Finland and Estonia, but, but beyond that, the, if that threat was properly understood, then those pipelines of weapons would be flowing much more freely. I think so. It's I crazy, also... though. How can they? I mean, you must, you must be more baffled than I am at how people can look at Putin and not see an existential threat to the current world order. I think... People lived in illusion for a very long time uh. that it's possible to talk to him. It's possible that he would, he only wants a part of Ukraine, etc., etc. Yes. And uh, also that Europe had very high hopes that um, the NATO umbrella will always be there. And right now, again, with uh, uh, so many statements uh, from Donald Trump, including, mm. uh, it seems that situation may really change and Europe needs to think about its own defense, and I want to say our own defense, yes, of because course. Uh, we can hold off this horde for only for only some that time that you will give us weapons for. We um, we cannot fight the enemy empty-handed. We will try. We are doing it at some points, but it is incredibly hard. So we really hope that the time that is being won right now by the lives of our people is being spent wisely and to ramp up the production. So Russia will stop. But this is not what we see right now. And, and the West and, and w that we can put weapons in, in your army's arms. Uh, Kira Rudik, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I, 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 I wish you, as always, I wish you well and your, and your countrymen and women well. Kira, the uh, leader of the Holos Party in Kyiv and, and, of course, a Ukrainian MP, painting a remarkable picture there um, that, that we knew about. We know about it on this program. We, we, we talk about it a, a, a lot, but still not as much as we should do. And yet I think that when you remember the mood music of the early days of the invasion, possibly the only thing that Boris Johnson did quite well um, was, was to muster support in this country because the traditional position of people that Boris Johnson sits most closely to politically is is not to get involved. Uh, in, in America, Donald Trump, who Boris Johnson continues to endorse, that doesn't, that, well, it's not our business. Why should we get involved? America First was, was the name of the movement in 
1930s America that didn't want to get involved in the Second World War. And, it, and it's a position that persists to this day. So Boris Johnson, who got almost everything wrong, if you remember when he got that right, obviously we're talking about Boris Johnson. So the only reason why he did it was because he thought it would be good for him. Never mind anybody else. He just thought it would be good for him. And it was because even I'm saying he got that right. But he did. He still got it right. If you think back to those days, the idea now and, and our capabilities are hugely limited. There's a reason why Kira talks about the European Union and the United States, which, of course, doesn't include us anymore. Um, you think back to those days, the early days of the invasion and the support for Volodymyr Zelensky and for the Ukrainian people in general. And now we're contemplating a battlefield where only one side has weapons. <laughs> Yeah, it's 12.47. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.51 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. There's quite a lot of stuff we haven't had time to get to get through today, which is great. We can do it all on... We can do it all on Monday if it's still live, because I do want to dedicate what's l left of the programme to the... Um, Continuing situation in Ukraine. We've heard from Luke Harding and indeed from Kira Rudik, who were both there, one to report, one as a politician to seek to influence events. We heard from Bill Browder earlier this week about the importance of that 300 to $500 billion, uh, depending on how you're counting it, in frozen Russian assets that could be, as, as Belgium are beginning to demonstrate, that could be confiscated and used to help Ukraine, um, to, here's a nice phrase for you, to help Ukraine help Vladimir Putin pay for the Ukrainian war effort and some of the imagery of Ukraine running out of ordnance while Russia is receiving it from regimes such as North Korea and Iran should give serious pause. I just mentioned briefly that um, among Liz Truss's absolutely uh, crackerjack uh, uh, utterances in America this week. She, she's accused the left in this country of being allied with Russia, Iran and, and, and China, presumably North Korea as well. That's why she's also, I've just seen footage of her, waving the Financial Times around while standing next to Steve Bannon. You know, the Nazis actually had a thing called Lügenpresse, which involved accusing all the media that was telling the truth of lying. Absolutely crucial brick in building the wall of Nazism that would eventually... Um, define 1930s and 1940s Germany. You've got a former British Prime Minister standing next to Steve Bannon at an event populated by people who deny that Donald Trump won, uh, that Joe Biden won the last American election, accusing the Financial Times of being in cahoots with the deep state to stop people like Liz Truss giving the country the policies that they really want. We've all gone mad, frankly. And, of course, the second anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine tomorrow reminds us all too poignantly of the stuff that we should be concentrating on a lot more than our own weird little domestic psychodramas. Anthony King is a professor of defence and security studies at the University of Exeter, another guest who has helped us on several occasions come to a better understanding of what is happening in Ukraine and why. He's the author of the book Urban Warfare in the 21st century and he joins us now i'll ask you what i've asked all my guests today anthony which is what do you think we should be talking about um well hello yeah uh, what do i think we should be talking about um we should be talking about um the absolute imperative requirement to support ukraine at a time when the war actually is beginning to turn in disfavor of Ukraine. And with the loss, the fall of Avdivka uh, just on Saturday, I think we are looking at moving into a different phase of the war. We might even say a crux point in the war coming at the moment and into the spring, where will Russian forces be able to leverage off that success for for the future? And, and, and so it's, it's an absolutely critical point. And I think we, we've got to think about the support that's needed to be provided. Well, what should we be looking out for? Well, well I mean, you, you, you mentioned the fall of Divka. What, what, they're not going to take big cities, are they? It's, it's, it's going to be an attritional kind of um, uh, uh, incremental move. But what would be massive alarm bells for, for those of us who want well, Ukraine to prevail? I think you're absolutely right. But it's, I think it is going to, it's always looked like a long war after the failure of the original yeah. operation. 
absolutely i think it's going to go into 2025 so what is the risk there i don't think there's going to be some massive huge russian offensive i don't think they've got the capabilities or the will to do that but a long grinding war consistently puts russia in the advantageous position and ukraine in the disadvantageous position primarily because Western support is the key vulnerability for Ukraine. And we've already started to see some of that. So whether we agree with it or not, the Germans have been great supporters of Ukraine, but the German lawmakers and parliament refused to allow this Taurus missile system to be uh, provided. Uh, and we have other bits of resistance going on, the Republicans in Washington. So we're looking at a long drawn out attritional campaign we need the West needs to and Ukraine needs to align what it, its strategic aims, but it needs to provide an underpinning of support. And that support will, I think, and has begun to fray a little bit around the edges. You, and that's deeply concerning. Yeah. Do you think it will? Um, I mean, you've got two elections in this country, this country in America, a, a couple of others elsewhere in pertinent, relevant countries. Do, 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 you, do you think a hardening of resolve from allies is likely or do you think a continuing fraying is is more likely to unfold in the coming months, next couple of I months? I think a hardening of certain powers, right. UK, Eastern European powers, they have, they have maintained a position and supported that position. I think as Russian advantages shows, they actually will sustain that level of support. The Republican Party... And the Trump nomination, it's, you know, I'm not saying anything nobody else doesn't know. I think it's deeply concerning. And if Trump does actually win the presidency, I think the concerns have been articulated across very many commentators are, are, are well founded. Uh, I mean, Russia have increased their production by about seven times seven, the amount, seven times the amount. They're producing two million artillery shells a, 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 a year. Um, they're out firing Ukrainian shells by 10 times the amount a day, 10,000 shells mm. versus 2,000 shells. I mean, there are materially significant support that Ukraine needs. And that political back structure, um, I, I think, is deeply concerning. Um, and if Trump gets in, I think the entire US strategy, we just don't know what the strategy is going to be. Um, and so I think that is that is concerning. If, if Ukraine don't get that support, Again, I don't even anticipate a Russian horde storming across Ukraine, but Putin essentially gets into a position where he can end this war in the way he wants to. Uh, and, I mean, the war may end, but Putin's imperial ambitions will not. Absolutely. So that is the longer-term thing. And, and, and here the argument is, which I, I think there's a lot of evidence to support it, if NATO, Europe, the West do not counter and support Ukraine here... They're going to have to, Russia, the Kremlin is not going to reorientate and become a friendly power. They have a hostile power on its border, which needs to be constantly deterred. So the deterrence can be in Ukraine or elsewhere, or if Ukraine goes badly, it will then come home in other ways. Do you know, um, we've spoken today to a, a foreign correspondent, a Ukrainian politician, and now a professor of defence and security studies. And that is the theme. That's the, that's the, 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 the thing that has come from all three conversations which have surrounded different areas and addressed different issues but all three of you coming back to that point if he prevails in ukraine he will move on to somewhere else and at some yeah. point the european the west whatever we want to call it at some point they're going to have to push back hard enough to stop him if they don't yeah. do it in ukraine they will end up having to do it somewhere else yeah i mean we we're used we like to deal with democratic powers we're dealing with an authoritarian hostile regime and therefore need to adapt our strategies in the face of that. That's not, it's not a placable regime. It's mm. one in which power and military power are the, are the currency of international intercourse. Um, thank you, Anthony King, Professor Anthony King, um, as I mentioned, from the University of Exeter, also the author of Urban Warfare in the 21st Century. If you've missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. If you need a little bit of hope, uh, from the political landscape at the moment. I cannot rec recommend the latest episode of Full Disclosure with the former American presidential candidate and the senator for Vermont, Bernie Sanders. Um, if you want to hear me fanboying and sounding quite starstruck, that would be another reason to tune in. Download it now for free from your app store or just head to globalplayer.com. Tom, with you at four, of course, on LBC. Now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC.